We'll uh, call a meeting to order. Welcome, everyone. First uh, item is invocation by Pastor Don Tijima. And uh, that'll be followed with a Pledge of Allegiance by uh, Colden Patterson. Join me in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we call upon you tonight, humbling our, our thoughts and our hearts to you, because you are the supreme authority. You are almighty. And we need your wisdom. We need your peace. We need your guidance. Father, we want to lift up all those who are suffering through the tragedies of the hurricanes and those who are there to help to ease their pain and their travail and rebuilding their lives. We thank you that you have blessed us here in this place with good weather. Thank you for the great rains lately. Sure has green things up. We thank you for the prosperity of this community. We pray for the health of this council and our mayor. We pray your protection upon our police and fire department and ambulance crews that take such good care of us. And Father, govern over this meeting, and may we bring honor to you in all things we say. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Pastor. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Colton. Okay, next item is roll call, Diane. Mayor Skoog. Present. Vice Mayor Nye. Here. Councilmember Anderson. Here. Councilmember Grossman. I'm here. Councilmember Mallory. Here. Councilmember Rooney. Here. And Councilmember Whiting. Here. We have a quorum, Mayor. Thank you, Diane. Next item, we have a, uh, two proclamations, Constitution Week in Arizona Falls. You want to read the first one, Diane? Constitution Week. Whereas September the 17th, 2017 marks the 230th anniversary of the drafting of the Constitution of the United States of America by the Constitutional Convention, and whereas it is fitting and proper to officially recognize this magnificent document and the anniversary of its creation, and whereas it is fitting and proper to officially recognize the patriotic celebration which will commemorate the occasion, and whereas Public Law 915 guarantees the issuing of a proclamation each year by the President of the United States of America designating September the 17th through the 23rd as Constitution Week. Now, therefore, I, Harvey C. Skoog, Mayor of the Town of Prescott Valley, Arizona, do hereby proclaim September the 17th through the 23rd, 2017, to be Constitution Week, and ask our citizens to reaffirm the ideals the framers of the Constitution had in 1787 by vigilantly protecting the freedoms guaranteed to us through this guardian of our liberties. Thank you, Diane. Apparently, nobody's here to receive the... There we are. Come on up. You want to introduce yourselves? This is Sue Burke, region of the Yavapai chapter, Linda Sheback, and Dorothy Castanos, all of the daughters of the American Revolution. Yourself? Okay, we have the uh, proclamation, and we present it to you. Thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you so More much. More comments? Uh, sure. There we go. It took the founders 116 days to finally get the Constitution together. It's now been 230 years since we've gotten the Constitution. 
So we should take this opportunity to celebrate the Constitution. Seventeen eighty seven was the year. Declaration of Independence seventeen seventy six, Constitution in seventeen seventy eight. How do we do between that time? Uh, well it was a struggle, but we made it. <laughs> <laughs> well th thank you so much. Appreciate okay. your All coming right. up. I hope we get a picture with you guys. Oh you want to where's okay. the, is Heidi gonna take picture? Oh there he is. Yeah. I was gonna okay. say let me get on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's got it. Oh. Okay, the next proclamation, Arizona fall, uh, Failed Prevention, fall Prevention, Diane, is somebody here to receive that too? Come on up. Arizona Falls Prevention Awareness Day, September the 22nd, 2017. Whereas falls have continued to be the leading cause of unintentional injury related hospitalizations, emergency department visits, and deaths among those Arizonans 65 and older, with 973 deaths in 2016, and whereas last year more than 14,000 older adults were hospitalized, and over nearly 43,000 emergency department visits were held among those 65 and older. And whereas unintentional falls resulted in about six days of hospital stay, and over $1.2 billion in medical costs, and whereas falling is not an inevitable result of aging, and whereas all of us have the power to reduce the risk of falling. Now, therefore, I, Harvey C. Skoog, Mayor of the Town of Prescott Valley, do hereby proclaim September the 22nd, 2017, as Falls Prevention Awareness Day in Prescott Valley, and urge all our older adults, family members, and caregivers, health care providers, fire and medical departments, first responders, and community partners to join the Arizona Falls Prevention Coalition on September the 22nd, 2017 for the Light Up the Night event in memory of those lives lost as a result of fall-related injuries and celebrate the 10 years standing together to prevent falls. And further, urge all health and human service providers to routinely assess older adults, including our veterans, and those with disabilities for fall risks. This uh, business of uh, getting old makes me nervous, but it's happening. <laughs> you want to introduce? <clears throat> Hello, I'm, I'm Virginia Rodriguez, and I work with Yavapai County Community Health Services. I'm a health educator, and I'm also the chairman of the Northern Chapter of the Falls Prevention Coalition. My name is Rachel Mills. I also work with Yavapai County Community Health Services, and I am a part of the um, Arizona Falls Prevention Coalition. Thank you so much. And I think Heidi wants a picture of you. So you'll have to uh, stand tall and smile. Thank you, Heidi. Any, uh, any other comments? Um, I just want to say that just because we all get older doesn't mean that we have to have a fall. And Yavapai County is, we have the highest rate of falls related deaths due to, um, wow. of, of deaths due to falling. So, but there are things that we can do to prevent them. Primarily staying active is the biggest thing. <laughs> no throw runs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. I'm going to uh, turn the. Thank you. I'm going to turn two items around and take number seven first. 
certificates, certificate of appreciation to Gene Singer for 15 years of service. Gene, are you here? Oh, right there, okay. Diane, do you have any comments? And I know uh, all these people have comments. Come on. Come on up. Oh, no falling. <clears throat> We're only going to talk about it. We're not going to demonstrate it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Ted. We're ready. We're ready. Okay. Today we're honoring Ida Jean Singer, better known as Jean or Jeannie to her family and friends. She has been with, working with us at the Prescott Valley Library for 15 years now. She is considered a friend, confidant, co-worker, and a great helper. She has been with the cataloging cataloging technological processing department in the library for those 15 years. She can process a book, CDs, CD books, CD music, DVDs in a flash. In other words, she does it all at the library in the most efficient manner. She takes the time to explain what technical processing is about to her co-workers and volunteers. She's friendly to all. When she smiles, it lights up her whole being. Her co-workers and volunteers are grateful for her knowledge and technique in processing our books and AV items. These items look very professional so much that when our patrons receive their items on hold or just get checked out, they are very, very satisfied. She takes pride in all she does for our library and the community that she serves. She likes her job so much that she comes in at 6 a.m. for 10 hours each day. She's willing always to go to the extra mile in all she does. She's very respected and loved. She has a wonderful family that support and love her as she does them. This shows in her love, laughter, commitment, and her dedication both in the library family as well as her own. She simply cares. We are truly grateful to our Jean. Thank you from all of us for your loving kindness and your service to all, Jean. Jean, did you write that yourself? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Vice Mayor Cummins? Well, who wants to be the first to tell a tale? We know. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. And you'll recognize this one, because you've read some of the author, um, yes, Miss yes. Julia. There was a, a book that, a series that we like, Laura Lee likes it, and there was a character in the book called Mima, And so she's Mima mainly because of some of her new grandchildren and foster grandchildren. So it stuck that she's now called, I only get to call her Mima at the library. I also want to say, you know, she really has a, a lot of, she produces a lot. There was a lull there, though, because there was a period where Ivan was under her yeah. direction. So during that time, I'm sorry to say, she didn't produce as much as she normally did. <laughs> Next. Anybody else? Jeannie is a perfectionist. <laughs> doesn't miss anything and when you're working for Stewart for that many years you got to be a perfectionist <laughs> to keep him on track because he's not been tracking lately <laughs> who, who got here on Sunday night with no key <laughs> Jean is our friend she's my friend for 17 years and I'm very appreciative of her and she keeps me on track and I'm I am so grateful that she's part of our family here in the Prescott Valley and the Prescott Valley Public Library as well. Thank you. Jeannie always impresses the volunteers with all her stickers. I impress on them stickers are important, and Jeannie's the one who makes sure they're in the right place. Any other council wish to comment? 
Jean, I'm going to give you, do you get some more comments? I do, I do. Um, every community has treasures. Every community has points of pride. Our library is a big point of pride for us. And this lady is a treasure and one of our points of pride and a blessing to anybody that gets a chance to be around her. Twenty minutes. <laughs> oh. I really like to thank Stuart. He hired me first and first I was a volunteer and then I became, you know, working in the back. I'm doing exactly the same thing, a little more now, than I was when I first, and I love what I'm doing. I love my job. I love the people around me. And uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll be here for 20. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I enjoy that. I'll give it a go. <laughs> but thank you very much. I really appreciate all the you might, support. You might identify. Oh, these are my two grandchildren. This is Cadence, and this is Haven. This is, and my husband. And my son, Matthew, my daughters, where's she? That, my daughter and my son in law, that's, that's Carrie and David. And your husband's name is? Is Bob. <laughs> 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 and by the way, this is a really a nice week because we just celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary last year. So I thought that was pretty good. Not too many people can say that. So <laughs> I was happy with that. Thank you. Well, congratulations Thank you. on your anniversary. <laughs> And Bob, congratulations. Keep up the good work. <laughs> well, okay. We're too old to do anything else now. <laughs> <laughs> With that, we have a uh, sort of appreciation oh, cool. award from the town of Prescott Valley mm -hmm. to Gene Singer, 15 years of dedicated service from July 2002 to July 2017. And that's yours. Thank you. <coughs> and a pin... Pin with a couple of emeralds. Whoa. Wow. And guess what? A check. You can have a little bit of fun oh, with that. Oh, cool. We're going out tonight, so yeah. <laughs> you said we're going out, or you just oh, your husband? Careful. Hold on. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and Heidi wants to get a picture. Everybody wants to get this way, and she wants a mic. Another certificate of appreciation to Kevin O'Hagan for 10 years of service. <laughs> and he's got his family with him. We are here tonight to recognize Sergeant Kevin O'Hagan for his 10-year anniversary with the Prescott Valley Police Department. Kevin began his career as a dispatcher in 2003 for the Northern Arizona University Department Flagstaff. In 2005, he attended the Arizona Law Enforcement Academy for NAUPD, graduating in 2006. Following his desire to move back home and raise his kids in their home community, Kevin started with the Prescott Valley Police Department in 2007. In 2008, he was assigned to the K-9 unit, where he spent three years with his K-9 partner, Bogar. Kevin left the K-9 unit a year later and in 2013 promoted to corporal. In 2012, Kevin was assigned to the SWAT team and still currently a SWAT operator. He has been a firearms instructor for five years and was recently assigned as the range master for the department. In 2016, Kevin was promoted to the rank of sergeant and re recently took over supervision of the canine unit. During his time at PVPD, he has spent a part of several large cases, but 
most rewarding experiences have been with the community programs that he has had the pleasure to be a part of. Kevin has participated in Shop with the Cop, National Night Out every year, setting up block watches and meeting with block watch leaders. Recently, he developed a relationship with Habitat for Humanity that allows him and several other members of the department the opportunity to build four different homes in Prescott Valley for underprivileged families. In 2007, April 2017, Kevin was awarded the police star for bravery on an incident where he and two officers entered a home where a family had been attacked with a hatchet by another family member and took the suspect in custody without the incident. Kevin was born and raised in the Prescott area and is a graduate of Mayer High School where he met his wife, Joanna, and they have three kids together, Nolan, Taylor, and Corbin. Congratulations, Kevin. Any comments, Vice Mayor, Laura? No. Sorry, I was being whispered to. But it's nothing you need to be worried about, Kevin. <laughs> um, it, it's very hard for me to get up and not get passionate and emotional about our police officers. I've been here a very long time now. And I've watched him from the very first day. He's one of them I did that with. And um, times change in a community, and sometimes there's positives and sometimes there are negatives. And our officers have to adjust to that. And uh, I'm sure you never expected to go out on the particular call that they just shared. But your training was there with you. Your fellow officers were backing you up. And that's what our department is about. Quality, excellence, support, and they're our family. And we're tremendously proud of our police family. Yeah, Kevin, congratulations on 10 years. Uh, Sergeant O'Hagan is one of those officers that I've gotten to know a little better than some of our other officers because I've had interaction with him. Uh, as you heard Lieutenant Gregory uh, in his uh, description and uh, qualifications for uh, Kevin, uh, you heard that he leads a group of police officers to help Habitat for Humanity. For those of you that are not aware of it, I am the tool manager for the construction crew for the Prescott Area Habitat for Humanity. So when they show up, I'm sort of responsible for making sure that they make it through the day. So I provide the coffee and donuts, so they do. <laughs> anyway, also because uh, I'm, a, I'm also a, a past president of the Prescott Valley Police Foundation, uh, I got to interact with Kevin, especially when the canines came to our meetings. Uh, I mean, that's always a big hit with kids and other people. So I got to meet Kevin through that. And uh, all through the years, uh, Kevin has always been just, just a great officer. And the fact that they do the work with Habitat and with other organizations, you know, they're very much community-minded. And, and Kevin is one of those that leads them in this uh, action. So uh, congratulations. and. Uh, We'll see you with the next build when we get back to Prescott Valley. And Rick, has he, looks like you have a comment? I do, just a couple of comments. First of all, Sergeant, thank you so much for your service to Prescott Valley. Uh, we do appreciate it each and every day. And to your family, thank you for sharing him with us. We do appreciate it. Thank you. Mike? Yeah, I just wanted to lend my congratulations to Sergeant Hagen as well. And I always mention uh, when we see our family, and I think it's rightly put that uh, our library family and our, our police department family, we are a family, and I think we all feel that way. But I'm always impressed, and I keep saying every time we go through uh, these 10, 15, or 20-year recognitions that I'm very impressed with the resume that our sergeants have by the time they've met that 10-year um, uh, mark and so it just says a lot in terms of our department 
and the fact that they're very professional experience and I ha would have no hesitation to depend on any of our officers uh, out in our community because they're ready. So uh, congratulations again and, and we thank your family as well for supporting you. Thank you. I think Jody has a comment. To you. Thank you, Mayor. I want to piggyback on Council Member Whiting, what he said about a family. And Sergeant, that you make family here with your own family, with your fellow members, and so does Jean as well. And what I see is we have friends here, and you demonstrate that, both of you. Thank you for being wonderful town employees. It's appreciated. Mary, you had a comment too? Kevin, thank you so much for the service you've given to the community. And uh, we're blessed to have you here. Bless your family. I know they're a big support to you. And we appreciate all of you as you are on the front lines, always taking care of us. You know, so thank you again. And, you know, when you hear those sirens go off throughout the street, you're in your house. I, I always encourage you to think about where they're going and what they're doing because they don't even know exactly what the call's about till they get there. Keep them in your prayers because they need it. They need our prayers and they need our support. Always be there for them because they're heading to something they're really not sure what's at the end of the call. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Mary. Then there's one other person that wants to say, make some special comments. Johanna? 20, 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's been a wonderful 10 years, and actually it's been really easy. We have a beautiful police family and love their wives and proud of my husband, and he does a really good job. And he works really hard at what he does. So thank you. You still have 19 oh and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That, we have an appreciation award from the town of Prescott Valley, presented to Kevin O'Hagan in appreciation for 10 years of dedicated service, September 2007 to September 2017. And also a pen with an emerald in it. It's yours, you. and you're up to speed. Awesome. Well, I'm glad you guys can't hear it because my squad's been calling me nonstop ever since I got up here. So thank you, guys. Um, and one thing that you guys talked about is the family, and we try to make our squad our family, definitely, and um, this is the harassment that I get for it, so. Um, but truly, thank you guys, this is the best squad that um, I think the department has, and it's, it's a lot of fun to be around. And 10 years, um, 12 total, with my wife putting up with the schedules and holidays and anniversaries and birthdays missed and everything that goes on with our schedules, but I truly appreciate everything that she does and everything she does with I just wanted to say I obviously am his favorite. Obviously, I see why. I play baseball, so I mean, it relates to him. But um, I'm really proud of my dad. Uh, he's been a really great role model, and uh, he's. <laughs> I don't know. Good. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't really know. No. Um, sometimes I get scared when my dad leaves. Hold on. the service of uh, those people who worked, have worked here for many years. And thankfully, we have a lot of employees with a lot of tenure, a lot of experience, a lot of dedication. Really have a super outstanding team of uh, employees. We're very proud of our staff. They're just absolutely outstanding. And, and believe me, I, I talk to the mayors from other communities. We're, we, our staff is tops. We're very proud of our staff. No, you want to send for a picture? Gregory, I should say. <laughs> Mike always gets in the way. Okay. 
it is. Thank you all. We appreciate that. Next, we have, uh, we're going to take the Chamber of Commerce, number six, for scheduled announcements. And that's Brady. You're, you are up, Brady. All right. Hi, I'm Brady. I work for the Chamber of Commerce. Um, as we know, Prescott Valley is always growing. We're growing um, incredibly quickly. And I love working at an organization that's kind of at the center of um, at least the business growth in our community. Um, we have a lot of new businesses come into town, and I have um, the honor of introducing I have Trisha Bracco and Brandon Napo from Native Grill and Wings to talk about Native Grill and Wings. Wow. <laughs> How's it going, guys? How's it going? So, uh, as you said, uh, we're going to be coming here pretty soon. Uh, if you've ever eaten at Native before, that's really big in the valley. Uh, we are extremely excited to now be a part of Prescott Valley. We were looking at places where we wanted to build and where we wanted to come up. Uh, I lived in Tucson and we'll be commuting back and forth from Phoenix. Uh, and that was just a decision we had to make because of my fiance's employment. However, uh, this is a great community. Just the small time that we've been here and the people that we've talked to and just sitting in this meeting, uh, I couldn't think of a better place to want to come to work and uh, be a part of. So a lot of, there's a lot of restaurants, there's a lot of things that you guys have going. Uh, we are gonna be completely engaged with this community, completely engaged with the schools in this community. Anything you guys ever need from us, I think I see boys in, or I'm sorry, uh, Boy Scouts or whatever's over here in the corner. Anything you guys ever need, we'll set up charity nights, foundation nights, uh, anything the council ever needs from us, please don't hesitate to come down. Uh, we're still in the process of building. We're looking at being ready to go. Beginning of November-ish is when we're uh, going to do our grand opening, but we'll have friends and family nights and all kinds of other things that you guys can participate in throughout October. So just wanted to come introduce ourselves. Trisha might have a couple things to say, but uh, I'm extremely excited, ecstatic to be out here, and uh, I hope to see you guys in the restaurant real soon. from here so it's a proud moment to be a part of something like this in this area so that's really all I have <laughs> all right and also joining us we have Tim Kennedy with the coolest car in town Prescott Valley limousine service ah. my name is Tim Kennedy as he said and I'm new to the area um, I came down here to retire uh, somewhat. I've been a chauffeur for many years, and so I purchased a new car that's not been rented out yet. It's uh, new to me, but it's a late model Lincoln Town car. It is a 10-passenger Lincoln Town car with only 80,000 miles on it. So it's a very safe car, and I thought coming to this wonderful community that you have here and to add to the community, and, and it's something that we can use for the to children, the schools, as well as other uh, occasions that you would normally have, weddings, of course, and any other occasions that you may all be interested in. Um, the car is... It's got the new lighting system I wanted to mention, it's, as well as the sound system. It does have the complimentary beverages that come with it. Um, other than that, it's a three-hour minimum, and we can uh, negotiate on the prices that we're going to start with. We're going to uh, have some other advertising coming out of regarding that, and they'll change throughout the prom season and through the seasons. So kind of nervous out here for the first time, but appreciate being here. And I've uh, got uh, my two kids here. I want to mention real quick that since I moved down here, I'm really Jim from Flagstaff. And my daughter has transferred down here from McDonald's Corporation. She's one of your supervisors from McDonald's. And just reopened up a new store here, I guess, in Chino Valley. Remodeled, I should say, remodeled the McDonald's in Chino Valley. So it's fun to have uh, my family here, and the community is wonderful here. I just built a house right down the street. I think a lot of you that may know me or have seen my car out there you might know where I live. And it's just been fun to, to be part of the community and to build a house out here and, and just to retire here. So if I can be of any help with Prescott Valley Limousine Service, give me a call. And I guess we'll go from there, so. Um, 
he was asking, sorry, he was asking for my phone number, a little nervous here. Our, our number, I'm sorry, is 928-910-0058. It is on the back of the limousine as well as we have some cards, I think Bradley's going to, we'll pass out some cards and some flyers as well. Um, in the questions, I guess, if there's any questions anybody has about the limousine service, if we got a minute. Um, go ahead. Just thank you again. Thank you, Mayor and Town Council. Thank you. Two great businesses. Thank you for introducing these two great businesses, and welcome to Prescott Valley. Appreciate having you. Good. Okay, now we go on to uh, number eight, communications comments. And I have some. Mr. Ken Davis, you come right on down here with the, all of those young people from the Yavapai chapter of Demolay. Come right on down because we promised them they could get a picture. And we're keeping our promise. And Mr. Davis, if you'd like, feel free to come right in front of here. Wherever you want them staged, that's where you put them. <laughs> Hello. Good. Any other comments? I, I'd just like to say oh, briefly, Greg. because I suppose a lot of you don't know what DMLA is. Uh, DMLA is an organization for young men between 12 and 21. Uh, it focuses on leadership and citizenship, and uh, we meet at the uh, Prescott Masonic Lodge uh, on uh, Willow Creek. Anyone that has children that might be interested, we would love the opportunity to talk with them. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you, young men. Any other co uh, council comments? If not, we'll move on to number nine, consent agenda. Councilmember Rick Anderson has promised to read that. Okay. All matters listed under the consent agenda are considered routine by the town council and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items. If discussion is desired, that item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered separately. Approving the July 13 executive session minutes, July 20 special and work study minutes, July 27 council minutes, August 3rd work study, and August 10, 2017 council minutes. B, approving the board and commission selection committee, July 31, 2017 minutes. C, approving payment of the Arizona Department of Res revenue assessment fee of $87,395. D, authorize the library to purchase materials over the $16,000 limit. E, accounts payable. F, quarterly sales tax report. G, approving the purchase of 18 Kenwood police portable radios and necessary attachments in the amount of $36,398.76. H, approving an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Prescott for regionalized dispatching services commencing on January 1st, 2017. I, approving resolution number 2016, accepting a GOHS Highway Safety Grant Award of $20,000, $20,733, and approving the contract 2018-AL-022 DUI Impaired Materials and Supplies. J, approving resolution number 2017, accepting a GOHS Highway Safety Grant Award of $24,800, and approving the contract 2018 PTS 055 traffic enforcement overtime. K, approving an amendment to the intergovernmental agreement with the 
Humboldt Unified School District for the housing of a virtual training simulator at Glassford Hill Middle School, and L awarding the purchase of hot melt crack seal materials for the fiscal year 2017-2018 to Craftco Incorporated in the total purchase amount of $19,018.88. Okay, uh, anyone uh, want to pull an item for, or do you want to approve it as a whole? Mayor, I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda by electronic vote. I'll second. Okay, with that, would you set the vote for us, Diane? Diane, I'm going to have to vote verbally tonight. How do you wish to vote? I am, yes. Councilmember Rooney? Diane, I'll have to vote verbally yes also. Okay. Mayor, that makes it uh, passage unanimously. Okay, thank you, Diane. Then we'll move on to number uh, 10, new business for review, comment, and or possible action, consideration of appointing John Roman to the personnel board. Uh, Laura, any comments? I do. With so many people here, I can't tell if Mr. Gorman is here. If he, there he is right there. Come right up here. See if I'd have looked in the first row instead of looking back there. One physician on the citizen alternate member on the personnel board became open when Donna Keller was appointed to a vacated full citizen member position on about June 22nd, 2017. Ms. Keller was first appointed to the personnel board of the alternate, I'm sorry, as the alternate citizen board member on May 11, 2016, to fill a term with a renewal date of April 25, 2018. The vacancy was advertised and two applicants were received. Vice Mayor Rick Anderson, at the time you were Vice Mayor, <laughs> And Councilwoman Laurelyn Nye and Mary Mallory conducted the interviews are, are recommending the appointment of Mr. John Gorman to fill the vacancy made by Donna Keller with the term renewal date of April 25th, 2018. And would you like to tell us why you were willing to come forward and participate in our community? Well, my wife and I moved here about a year ago, and uh, the communities that we've lived in, uh, both of us have always been involved in some type of volunteer work, and we both feel that, uh, that uh, we should give back to our communities. And this is, one, this is an opportunity that I feel that I have a background and experience in, and I appreciate the time that the council has given me and I appreciate this opportunity to become part of this community and give back to the community. So thank you. Good, appreciate that. Any uh, other comments? Rick? Well, I just wanted to say we were very impressed with the interview that we had with you that morning. And uh, I'm looking forward to your, to your service with the town. So thank you very much. Okay. Any comments, Mary? Just I'd like to thank John and for the uh, commitment that he makes to the communities. And uh, we appreciate you being here and uh, the contribution you have to give forward. Thank you very much, sir. Now we need a motion to make it legal. Anyone care to make a motion? If it doesn't, it dies for lack of a motion. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mayor, I'd be happy to make a motion uh, to approve uh, appointing John Groman to the personnel board. And I'd you like to make a second. Now, I, I got spelled one way as Groman and the other way as Gorman. What's correct? Gorman, G-O-R-M-A-N. Okay, great. And we have a motion and a second. Yeah, we're ready for the vote. Would you set the vote, Diane? Now this... Set, Harvey. I'm sorry. Oh, my gosh. It's already <laughs> on here. Now we'll see if it passes. Councilmember Anderson? Yes. And Councilmember Rooney? Yes. That passes unanimously, Mayor. Mr. Gorman, thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, community.
Okay, next we're going to have a public hearing. General Plan Amendment GPA 14-006, PCC Condos Parcel B. Richard, any comments? Yes, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of the council, I'm going to introduce uh, both items to you. Uh, obviously, they're going to be, ha uh, be uh, have to be acted on separately. Uh, however, they are related. Uh, the illustration before you on the screen is an illustration of an area known uh, in the community as a triangle area. It's also referred to as Parcel B. Uh, that uh, property uh, was uh, or is part of the Prescott Country Club golf course uh, in the center of the golf course and is surrounded by the Prescott Country Club. Uh, the golf course uh, is annexed to the town of Prescott Valley as are properties along Tapadero uh, Street as well as the clubhouse. Uh, the Yavapai County in 1983 uh, reviewed applications for the distribution of condominium units uh, throughout uh, the country club, including then Parcel B, also an area known as Cottonwood Cove, and an area that uh, has been excluded from this application that I'll also discuss that was a uh, pond area at one point in time. This illustration gives you a better indication of the relationship between the properties and it's important. Uh, parcel B is subject of your review as part of a general plan amendment. It's designated in the town's general plan as low density residential development. Proposed is uh, multiple family development, so it would require a change in the town's general plan to be able to accommodate that proposed use. Illustrated here, you can see also area C, and that area was uh, rezoned by Yavapai County in 1983 to accommodate 75 uh, condominium units. Uh, those 75 units are now uh, proposed <clears throat> as part of uh, your next action to be redistributed into two areas, that being parcel B and parcel C. Uh, parcel B accommodating 40 uh, of the previously approved units and parcel C accommodating the remaining 35. Uh, both properties would be accessed uh, by public roads uh, within the area, one from a cul-de-sac uh, into the Cottonwood Cove area the other off of Buena Vista through the golf course to Parcel B. This illustration is intended to show the zoning in the area as well as the area identified as uh, A on the illustration. That was an area previously proposed to accommodate additional uh, condominium units. The original applications filed with my office involved 105 units in these three areas. The applicant over the course of the last three years have refined their applications and brought forward now the proposal to move a portion of the entitlements from parcel C to parcel A and move forward with the same entitlements that were given to parcel C by Yavapai County in 1983. Uh, this illustrates um, the preliminary development plans that were provided to the Planning and Zoning Commission. The Planning and Zoning Commission um, reviewed these in a public hearing and forwarded their recommendation to you for approval. They did caveat that they'd like to look at uh, more uh, specific information, excuse me, in the form of a final development plan before it's uh, presented to the Town Council in the future. They'd like to look at the technical aspects uh, of these applications. The uh, next application uh, on your agenda after your public hearing on this regards the zoning map change, and I intend to, uh, with your permission, Mayor, make remarks in respect to the technical uh, documents that were presented in support of the zoning map change. I can share with you a couple of points. Uh, Peter Burgoyce is here representing the applicants. He spoke at the Planning and Zoning Commission. He may have remarks that uh, he would like to make to you in addition to mine. Um, also, we received petitions from uh, property owners 
uh, at least represented to us that involve 20% of the property owners within 300 feet. In consultation with our town attorney, uh, while the uh, state statute is silent on administrative acts, which would be a resolution, uh, there is a requirement for your passage of an ordinance, uh, such as your next action, that that be done by supermajority. That's because uh, it has been presented to us and we have no reason to doubt that they have collected signatures of 20% of the property owners within 300 feet. I have to share with you, I haven't had the opportunity, having received these late yesterday afternoon, to actually review and confirm that, but I'm taking it on face value that that has been represented to the staff and we are recommending that your, your second action, which is on the ordinance, uh, needs to be done by a supermajority. With that, Mayor, I'd like to conclude my remarks and ask uh, if you would like to invite Mr. Burgoyce up, and it may be prudent for him to take you through soup to nuts uh, with his uh, proposal. I would re respond to any questions from you, Mayor, uh, the council or the audience at your direction and I would assist Mr. Burgoyce if uh, he needs assistance in that regard. Let's bring Mr. Burgoyce up. Peter? Good evening, uh, Mayor Skoog, Vice Mayor Nye, members of the council. Uh, my name is Peter Burgoyes. I'm a local landscape architect, land planner. I've been working in the area for, in the Quad City area for about 20 years. Um, worked on many of the projects here in Prescott Valley and been fortunate enough to, to enjoy that relationship. Um, as Richard pointed out, um, he did a great job of summarizing. Um, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of the technical aspects that we've looked at, but one of the things Richard mentioned about the, about the planning commission approval was contingent or they put in the caveat of reviewing the, the uh, final development plan or having planning commission review of the final development plan prior to it coming to council. We're, we're fully in agreement with that. We re realize that technical aspects need to be uh, well vetted and looked at, and so uh, we think it was a good recommendation. Um, I'll, I'll hit some of the highlights of what of the preliminary development plans that were submitted and kind of give you an overview. Before I do that, though, I think an important thing to point out is uh, the, the, the applicant has strived to prepare a plan and application that fits the context of the country club. Okay, what does that mean? That means homes that, that fit within what would normally be expected of seeing on a, on a golf course, um, doing them in a way that's architecturally appropriate, doing them in a way that fits the, fits the landscape, um, and doing them in a way that protects the asset that is there, and that asset being the country club and the golf course. Um, that really is truly a, the biggest asset there, and we want to preserve that value and keep an active business going while making a, you know, enhancing the community. Um, what I'll do is, Richard, can I just scroll through these? We're not getting a picture up there. I wonder if Ryan could uh, take the light. What's happening? Oh, is that what happened? Larry says lightning fried the connection. We have it now. Have we been struck by lightning? Is that what I hear? Yeah, that's what he says, yeah. Yeah, literally. <laughs> Sunday. Oh, no. So you don't have an, Im you don't have an image? We'll have we have it in our we have it in okay. detail. Okay, all right. Back here too, yeah. um, the, the picture that was up here a second ago showed the overall golf course and where the location of the, the areas are that we're looking at. As Richard pointed out, the the 75 homes that were approved in 1983 have been proposed to be redistributed into two areas and not just one area. So it's, it's kind of spreading out the, the density. It's taking that density and, and more or less splitting it in two from 40 units in the, let me make sure I get the right images here.
well, it may be a little hard to see here, but it's splitting the, the units between that triangle that you saw in the previous slide in area B and area C, so that 40 are in area B up north in the triangle, we'll call it, and then 30 will be down in the Cottonwood Cove area, and we're referring to it as Clipper Wash or Clipper Townhomes. Um, the one area B we're calling the, the Fairway Townhomes. The Fairway Townhomes, as, as Mr. Parker pointed out, will be accessed off of Buena Vista by an access drive there that comes between, and I apologize, I can't remember which T and which green it is, but it's not coming across a fairway, it's coming between the holes. Um, the Clipper Wash Townhomes will be accessed off of Cottonwood Cove on the south, and like I said, we're we're splitting them up and reducing the density of that, that area down there and shifting it up to the north. A couple of things that we have done and um, in request by the town uh, during the process was a uh, traffic study. And subsequent to that traffic study were, were a couple of amendments or addendums as well as responses to questions that were raised not only by the neighbors but by the county. Um, and that response was done, uh, and the, well, the response and the report were prepared by Lee Engineering. Uh, with us tonight is the traffic engineer from Lee Engineering, Paul Guzik. Uh, so if you have some specific traffic questions, uh, he can address those. So the traffic study was done in request, uh, at a request, uh, as a result of the request by the town. Uh, the other thing that was produced was a drainage study. That drainage study looked at, at what the overall drainage implications are from the two areas. The drainage in area B um, will come down to the area A, which Richard referred to as a former pond site, um, and that'll be through a system of closed system and open system drainage. Now, the details have not been done. That'll be part of the final development plan. Um, but the drainage study did a few things. One is it, it looked at the two-year, five-year, 10-year, 25, and 100-year flood events or, or rain events and looked at the capacities of that area A to handle the runoff from, B, from the townhomes on, that are located in area B. So A can handle that storm water. And then Clipper Wash down by the Clipper townhomes can handle the, the drainage from Clipper townhomes. So that was the focus to determine if there was capacity in those areas to handle them. That was done by Lion Engineering, um, which some of you may have seen in other reports or other studies. And then a couple other things were done. Um, CYFD commented on the plans on two occasions and put conditions in on the plans uh, that will be built into um, the plans so that we're meeting emergency and fire access requirements. That's important. And then another thing that is done, and it gets back to the aesthetic of the, of the project, is the reduction in height of the buildings. Um, the buildings are two-story buildings. That height will enable us to keep the overall height well under the allowable height of 35 feet. It'll bring it down more in the neighborhood of 25 feet, and not exactly, but in that neighborhood. So it allows us to keep the profile down. And I, I assume this is in your, in your package, but that's a, a conceptual view of the townhomes themselves. Two stories, that dashed line that you see above the roof is the height that could be built under town code. Um, so we're trying to, keep that profile low and not, not, not needing to utilize the full 35 feet. There were four neighbors, neighbors meetings, uh, well attended, uh, a, lot of, a lot of discourse, a lot of discussion, um, which is good, that's a healthy thing for neighbors meetings. Um, and I'll go back to kind of what I said earlier, the, the, the goal has always been to produce or, or prepare a project or a plan that really fits within the context of the golf course and the golf course community. Okay, what does that mean again? It means what you see today or what is, 
the asset is still there. The golf course is still there. A home along the golf course, if you have one, you'll still be able to look out and see the fairway or the green or the tee and golfers going back and forth. You'll be able to step out of your backyard and enjoy that. Um, will the golf course shift a little bit? There's got to be some minor adjustments made to it, but nothing that is, is substantial to the golf course itself and the integrity of it. So it's preserving that asset, which is very, very, very important and preserving the business of running that asset. Um, the other part of it too, and from an aesthetic standpoint, in those homes that, this is Fairway Village, um, the triangle area on the north area B, the homes along that north side are more than 200 feet away from the homes across the fairway. On the east side of it, the homes are 600 feet away. On the west side of it, the homes are about 400 feet away. So the distances, while they aren't huge, uh, they're, they're, they're good. Um, and those are the, those are the homes along, along just those fairways. So um, in terms of the distances and the rest of the homes along the rest of the golf course effectively will not be affected by visibility or seeing those homes, seeing the new, excuse me, seeing the new townhomes. So we're trying to protect the asset, stay in character with the golf course, and do it in a way that's responsible, um, and do it in a way that that um, really kind of meets the, the 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 character of the area. So I will. If you have any questions right now, and like I said, Paul Guzik is here. If you have any traffic questions, more than happy. Anyone? Uh, Mike? Yeah, I just had a, a question. In your renderings uh, that show the two areas and the condos, are those what it'll look like, or have they been changed at all, or these are the up-to-date renderings as far as uh, uh, Site B and, and Site C? Those are up-to-date. Okay. Um, now, that's not to say they may not have to change a little bit when we get into the final development plan uh, to tweak them to make adjustments. The roadway distances, parking allowances, things like that in terms of uh, meeting, meeting uh, code requirements have been met with those. Um, so, and the architecture isn't down to the nail and, and stud and all that, but they, they, they're the same. Oh, I'm sorry, Jody. Thank you, Mayor. I do have a traffic question. Could we get him to come on up? You have to use the microphone a little closer, Jody. Okay. okay. Oh, there we go. There. Oh, welcome. Good to see you. Thank you. Welcome. In regards to the volumes of traffic that were expected with the increased density, can you explain that to us? In our analysis, we use trip, we estimate trip generation rates by the IT trip generation manual that tells us what is estimated for a day and for an AM peak hour. Let's talk closer. Let's get closer. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> for AM peak hour and then also for a PM peak hour. And the units of the apartments here will typically generate about seven trips per unit per day. And then in any peak hour, you're looking at about a half a trip per day. So a 45 for 40 units um, area B might generate about 300 daily trips and in, in an AM or a PM peak hour about 30 or less trips. Mm -hmm. If you could put that in context for what that looks like for the existing residents with the increased uh, volumes when you add it together. Well, in a in a per minute basis, it's less than one. You know, it's it's one vehicle every ninety seconds that'll be additional. Um, right now, in the in the peak hour, in a in a direction, you're, we're looking at about 180 to 200 vehicles per direction leaving in the AM. So the unit B in the 44 trips will only add about 25 vehicles in that peak hour direction. Okay. So is that what we're talking for, worst case scenario of the volume that's added to the existing infrastructure? Yeah, if we were considering both A and B, the 75 total units, mm -hmm. um, in the AM peak hour, we were looking at an additional 46 trips that would be both coming in and coming out total. Mm -hmm. 
in the PMP Gower, you look, we're looking at a total of 50, about 52 trips, 35 coming into uh, the residence and 17 leaving. Okay, good, thank you. Good, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay, this is, uh, anything else you want to add uh, before we introduce, uh, give the public a chance? Okay, anyone from the public care to comment? We'll, we're going to allow three minutes per comment. Come on up, ma'am. Thank you. I'm Margaret Darnell. I live on Manzanita. And I feel compelled to voice my concern over yet another jo zoning change for the country club. Ordinance 787 started this whole mess and no one except the halls knew anything about it or were notified. Seven changes for one piece of property? Is that normal? I'm not clear how ZMC 14-006 would benefit the community when at each meeting held, over 99% of the people were against the changes. It seems to me this issue keeps coming up to a vote until the halls get exactly what they want, no matter how negative the impact is on the country club neighborhood. It was noted at the last meeting by the board members of the Planning and Zoning Commission how inadequate the presentation was with no solid information, just pictures stating similar to, like, sounds like a bunch of smoke and mirrors to me. I do not understand how such a vague report that impacts so many people in a negative way could even be considered. How can you in good faith vote for something so vague and detrimental to the whole country club community? Thank you for your time. Thank you. And uh, next, anyone else? Can make comment? Yes. Uh, Welcome. Good to see you. Hello. Um, my name is Amy Bentley. I live out in the Prescott Country Club. I live on 11110 Ironwood Lane. And uh, I understand that development happens, changes happen, and things. But my feeling of this is it's not really a change that fits in with our community. Most of us have lots that are a quarter of an acre. We have single-family homes on that. This parcel, the triangle, is approximately four acres. So that means that there should be about 16 units on it max. They're asking for three times that amount. Also, uh, it's in the middle of the golf course and it does obstruct views. And I understand that the golf course is an asset, but also the houses around the golf course, we are all assets to it as well. And everybody that lives there, about 75 units are probably viewing this area are going to have their assets reduced of their value. And so I'm just kind of like asking you to step back, look at what's being presented, see if it really is logical. You know, the traffic study was done in January. That's the low point of traffic because we have a lot of summer residents out there. So I'm just asking you guys to just kind of step back, look at this in a logical sense, put yourselves in our shoes, would you want to have your assets sitting there looking at the golf course to be reduced by the value of this? And is there some sort of a compromise that everybody could come to where it doesn't reduce the residents out there for increasing the asset of the golf course? Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. appreciate that. Anyone else? Well, greetings. How are you? I want to read this briefly because I don't want to forget anything about it. My name is Sandra Downs, and I live on Manzanita in the Prescott Country Club. And this is kind of a put-together from our citizens. Um, the zoning, can you hear me? And hello, homeowners. Welcome. Um, the zoning laws by statute in the Arizona Constitution clearly state that private property of adjacent homeowners shall not be damaged or values lowered by the actions of a city, 
town, municipality, or government entity by a zoning measure enacted that changes the original use. To further protect and to re reimburse such overreach, Proposition 207 was signed and codified in Arizona statute section, so on, so on, attached in this file known as the Private Property Rights Protection Act. The homeowners and residents had presented to you at a previous initial meeting a thousand signed petitions of opposition for zoning and also have adamantly questioned the matter of the annexation in 2014 that occurred without the knowledge of the 3,000 residents. At the last neighborhood meeting, on, or the one before, June 23rd, at the Prescott Valley Library, approximately 100 people were in attendance. They clearly and continuously objected and asked the developers to stop the destruction of the golf course, the views, the privacy, and their home values. Um, I'm appealing to the fundamental principles of the Founding Fathers. This country stands with the people who have character and who are not afraid to stand up for what is right. Millions have stood up to protect our values and given their lives for a cause they believe in. And what's the difference in what's happening now? For the people of this great state of Arizona, town of Prescott Valley and Yavapai County, why not step up and remember that government of the people, by the people, and for the people? This should not be of the town, by the town, and for the town, and a developer at the direct cost of destroying property values of hundreds of homes. The pretend project is so flawed by an irregular inspection of medical and fire and transportation authorities. No approval would ever be given by a planning department. Once the true dimensions of the areas were provided, there's not sufficient area to turn around fire and emergency equipment by today's code stand. I don't know if you realize it or not, but it's two lane, Manzanita is a two lane road with deep ditches on either side. So what has been presented to you through community development for the past three years was something that the county tentatively approved in 1983. Think of it, 34 years ago, the population in the town of Prescott Valley in 1983 was 3,410 people. The population, the country club then, maybe 500 homes. The Fame family was very careful to leave the legacy of the golf course as one of their first developments in a pristine environment. They wrote and recorded a, uh, a document that stated that the pond parcel C would never be developed until the last living death, the Ronald Reagan family had been dead for 25 years. And parcel B was to remain as open space. Our attorneys have research, researched these issues very carefully and have the recorded documents present to you. You have a lot of this stuff in a packet that was presented to you today. At that time, Pre uh, Yavapai County gave a preliminary okay to the Cottonwood Springs area for a low density development of 75 story homes. The parcel was then almost seven acres. Right now, it's 3.7 acres. Less than half of the original property, yet the halls keep telling everyone that they are entitled to do oh so many things that are clearly a figment of their imagination. And my own personal opinion is that some of the professionals that got up here and told you about traffic and density and all that stuff up there have bumped their heads. And I want to thank you very much for letting me uh, Thank you, speak. Sandra. Uh, any, uh, anyone else? Yes. Welcome, good to see you. Thank you um, to the town council, um, to the town staff. Uh, my name is Martha Duncan. I've spoken before <laughs> to the planning and zoning, to you and at each of the meetings that were held uh, for the last three years in regards to this project. I have uh, over there in the the United States Postal Service over there, I have recently brought in, in the last month, we circulated petitions for people that were objecting to uh, the, the new zoning. There's about 600 there. If any of you look through there, we presented in the package to you today um, from the last meeting the signatures of, I think there were 101 people in attendance, 80 signed opposition, 
uh, two signed okay, four no signature, and then there were some blanks. Clearly at every juncture, at every meeting that we have had, the people of the Prescott Country Club have asked for this to be halted. Um, there's never been a need for it, and that's one thing according to zoning standards that you have to prove that there is a need for new zoning. Proof that the project is compatible with the surrounding area. PCC is primarily single family housing and proof that the project will add value to the area, not destroy it. And I will quote something that Laura Lee Nye had in the paper regarding the Navajo Commons Council, uh, not too far back, that the Navajo Commons was not altering the scope of the neighborhood there. Prescott Country Club is a quiet community of primarily single family homes, and at that time, um, for it to remain the same, not to be uh, inundated with condos, townhomes, or apartments that would be a significant loss to the homeowners there. The other thing is in accordance with, I was very happy that you were presenting things about the Constitution and the values since 1778, and one of the main things that's always been is protection of private property and their homeowners' rights. When a zoning proposal is considered, it must be for the long term and the benefit of the surrounding homeowners, not just for one individual. The Arizona Constitution clearly says that in accordance with Article 2, Sections 1 and 2, the Constitution of Arizona, the legislative body of a municipality shall consider the individual property rights and personal liberties of the residents of the municipality before adopting any zoning ordinance. Clearly, uh, in previous comments and previous things that we have filed, not only with the zoning, but with the town council and letters to members, in the last 15 months, there have been nine houses that have sold along Buena Vista and Manzanita that will be looking at that triangle area, anywhere from thirty-five dollars to $75,000 loss in their value. And that's a proven fact. There's been houses there that have sold for $87 a square foot, when Quailwood and the other surrounding areas are in the $125 to $135 a square foot. And that I know, we have that documented from the Prescott uh, Multiple Listing Service. So they are, this three-year stigma that they are going to build in the middle of the golf course out there with one way in and one way out, there's, it's destroying people's lives, their values, Golf course views are primarily the same as ocean view. You don't just take that away. When people have bought expensive homes, and that's what they look out is the open space, it shouldn't be taken from them. And one other comment I want to make is, at the last planning and zoning, um, Mr. Dusky, who I believe has been nine years on the planning and zoning, and very, very well respected, he spent probably 15 minutes begging and making his case. He knew parcel B was open space in 1983. It was asked twice in 83 and 86 to have houses built on it. Yavapai County remained, said that it remained open space when it was given to the town of Prescott Valley by a letter that I have from Richard Mock directly to Richard Parker. Parcel B was designated in December of 2013 as open space. Mr. Dusky was very clear that it should remain open space. It should not be developed. He made a plea from his heart, and the Planning and Zoning Board just nodded against it. So the one thing that I would like to add is, or ask, I guess, is if, in fact, this is considered a reading, will the next reading of the same um, zoning request be 30 days or 60 days from now? And secondly, I'm asking that you deny this zoning for the benefit of the 3,000 homeowners in Prescott Country Club who have begged and pleaded for three years for you to say no to this project. Thank you, I appreciate Thanks. that. Thanks. Oh, welcome. My name is Michael Matthews, and I live on 11177 East Manzanita. I purchased my home in the Prescott Country Club development 10 years ago and have enjoyed the community, 
have enjoyed the golf course as a somewhat um, avid golfer. Um, it, is, it brings a lot of pleasure to me and to my friends to be able to enjoy what I believe is the greatest amenity in the Prescott Country Club development. Um, I am here to speak in support of the halls and of the, of the country club. There are, you're hearing a lot of opinions about people as if, as if everyone is against this development, and everyone is not. There are considerable numbers of homeowners and members of the community and the, golf, and the country club that support the halls and their endeavor to maintain the golf course and keep it operational and functional. What, what would happen if it, the halls own a private business? When a business doesn't make money, what happens? As we know from Haciampa, another high-end golf course in Prescott, that golf course was shuttered for up to five years, and it sat as vacant field. What, what kind of value do you think that has on all of the homes within that development if that golf course were to shutter? I disagree with some of their assumptions that um, home values would be negatively impacted. I'm, I'm in commercial real estate in the Valley. I own a small commercial property management company, and, and I see an, an the value of new improvements to, to the community. Um, I believe that new, house, new affordable housing in the community would be of a benefit. And they talk about the triangle being open space. It, it is a, a dirt field. And there is plenty of green open space. I do not believe that there is going to be a significant impact to traffic. Um, if they were to build 40 units in that triangle, what they're doing is spreading the density from parcel C to, to a wider area. That dispersion will have benefit. Um, let's see. I believe that the new housing will add value to the community and, and will, will positively impact all of the homeowners within the development. So I stand in support of the halls and I stand in support of their application for a rezoning. Can Council Member Mallory ask you a question? Please. Thank you. Yes. Um, you know, i just like to ask you, I know there's many real estate forms out there. There's one that talks about the market condition advisory, and it says on the top line that real estate markets are cynical and can change cyclical. over time. Cyclical. Oh, sorry. Yes. It is in cynical, too, okay. right now. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> it's pretty cynical. Not everything goes up, right. Okay. <laughs> and it is impossible to predict, to predict the future market conditions with accuracy. And that form I've seen come across many times to buyers um, that are saying, you know, this is where we're at and it can change. I know that in m my home value, I had um, plenty of open space, you might say, and my home was $100,000 less than what I owed on it. So I just wondered when, when it comes to that form, that's out there, it's, it's kind of giving a heads up. We don't really know where we're going or what we're doing. We, we don't, and, and in the last seven years, the economy has been very challenging. And um, there are many factors that, that affect property values. Um, we always hear location, location, location. Who wouldn't want to live on a golf course? That has got to be a positive impact of value. Um, the, the, you know, there are, fortunately, the macro economy has been improving. We're seeing uh, jobs uh, being added to the community. Th those, are all, those all have much greater impacts on real estate values than building 40 townhomes in a golf course community. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Great. Thank you. I, again, I, I would... Not everyone in the community is opposed to this, and and you need to know that while there is a loud, vocal 
group of dissension, there is also many people that are in support. Good, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any comments? Come on up, welcome. My name is Linda, and I again. live on I Manzanita. So. Your name again? Linda. Runa. Like tuna. Okay, thank you. <laughs> anyway, um, I have been there since December. I lived on Manzanita, and when I bought the house, I knew nothing of this. The traffic is horrendous, and I mean horrendous. It's a two-lane, there's no sidewalks. People try to go and walk their dogs or get some exercise on those roads, and they, it's virtually impossible. For me to go out and get my mail, and I'm not lying to you, I literally have to stand there, wait till the cars go by, and then I can open up my mailbox, hurry up and get it, and get back on my driveway. It is that bad. I don't know how any emergency service can even turn around there. If there's an accident, God forbid, it's going to be all blocked off. The only reason I'm saying this is because I was not told anything about this in my disclosure when I bought our house, and I did buy it from Mrs. Hall, the mother. And she left quite fast after we bought it, so... I don't know if she knew what was going on, but we never did a disclosure on the real estate. If I would have known it, I would have never bought it. So anyway, basically what I wanted to tell you is by me living there, I actually live on Manzanita. We have construction up on the top of the hill that's not even in Prescott Country Club, and the trucks go all day long. The cement trucks go all day long. The traffic is terrible. All the workers that go work on these houses are going up that road. Can you imagine with the construction in this area what it's going to be like? Because when you come into Manzanita, that's one way in, one way out. And with Maverick being there, you have terrible traffic coming out of Maverick going into the country club. And we have to wait sometimes at the light to get out. So I just want to express it to you how important it is that the traffic is terrible. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anyone else? Welcome. Good to see you. I am Bob Darnell. I live on Manzanita. In fact, my house is just underneath the dash there between four and zero. And it's a uh, half acre. And uh, Manzanita Trail is about a mile and a half long until you get down to Turquoise, which Area C is going to come out of. And it's a two-lane road. And I'd say 90% of those houses have to back out of their driveway on the Manzanita Trail. I'm lucky. I've got a circular driveway, which is, by the way, a... Uh, cul-de-sac for the drivers that make, want to make U-turns. Anyway, uh, that's a traffic problem. Uh, or as the, uh, the halls, they've never stated how they're going to improve our community. It's all words. Nothing has ever said, we're going to do this. The prior owners of the country club uh, along the, the dirt path there along uh, the 8th fairway is the uh, cart trail and an easement. The previous owners mowed that. Now the halls, that grass is that tall. They're not taking care of it. The owners of the country club before had a good restaurant, uh, a good bar. Uh, the kitchen was good. There's nobody going there now. They, and as far as Area B is right out my back door. And uh, they use that to put uh, the tree limbs that have fallen down, trash and dirt. And they don't even mow that either. So they're not doing anything to help the community. As far as the technical stuff, the drainage of Area B goes 
in the opposite direction of A. In the technical portion of it, there's a 30-foot difference from the top of area B to uh, A, and through the north, it's, they got to cut a ditch or a pipe that goes underneath area B into area A. They have not talked about it. They have not talked, and there's a 30-foot drop, and there's no excavation uh, mentioned. They're going to have to do something to bring that into level or whatever. The information is not there. Uh, we've asked many times, what are you going to do with the uh, maintenance yard where Area C is right now? No answer. We're getting absolutely nothing. And I think the county back in 83, when they said, keep it, open space, they meant it, it was right, and I think you guys need to follow that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Well, welcome. Appreciate your coming. Okay. My name is Helen. Can I pull it down just a little bit more? Further? There's yeah, something like me? that. Maybe Helen. Little, even an inch or two more. Helen Kupchinski. I'm a resident of the Prescott Country Club. You'll have to pull the mic down just a little more. There you go. Um, first of all, I, I think it needs to be put on the record that none of you are our representatives. We don't vote for you. On, we are on. county residents. We've got to change that, but go ahead. You're going to change that. Oh. That is exactly partly what's wrong. That's up you, to you do want to annex the Prescott Country Club, and you've already done an end around by annexing something like 145 acres. That's not the full Country Club property. That's not how government is supposed to work for us. You're supposed to be the most truthful people in your planning for the future. And you are not being level with the property owners that are there now. And neither is the county. This project, if the, the halls took it to the county for some kind of a general plan amendment or county zoning planning, they should be hearing it not the city. We have no representation with any of you. And not only that, but I'd also like to ask the planner if he has uh, addressed secondary access for any of these parcels. I don't see it up there. And that's a very dangerous situation in emergency situations particularly. You have a fire. Where's secondary access on any of them? Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. <laughs> a question for you? Okay, I'd like to uh, limit it to 10 people. We're on number nine now. Welcome, good to see you. Well, I appreciate that I'm not number 11. You're not number 11. <laughs> I thank you for that. I've been at every one of these I need meetings. Your name, no, first. Joan. Joan. Egnatov. Good, thank you. I've been at every one of these meetings since day one, and I've never heard one person in favor of it except him. It's kind of strange to me that in all these meetings and all this time, nobody has ever been for this except today, one, but you've had hundreds in opposition every single meet this isn't happy people here these are pissed off people because you're affecting their lives the decision that you make affects everybody in this room in a negative way this isn't going to help us this isn't here to help us as a matter of fact it isn't even going to help the halls because their home is now for sale They've created this mess, and then they're going to leave. So how is this benefiting us? No one has ever said, oh, we're going to improve. How? 
You're not improving our traffic. You're not improving the cost of our property. You're not improving the value of our property. It's negative in every single way. And the lady that just said there's no one here speaking for us, she's right. We have nobody helping us. We're here on our own, time and time and time again, begging you to stop this nonsense for two people to be able to come in to a community and create this kind of havoc in these people's lives, I don't understand it. I do not understand if there's some kind of money behind it. I would venture to say everybody in this room spends at least 95% of their money in Prescott Valley. We have no stores. We come here to shop. Everything that we do is in Prescott Valley. This is where we spend our dollars. We need your help to protect us from this. Thank you. Thank you. Good. One more, if there's someone else that would like to comment. If there is no, any further comments, Richard? I know I, I saw Ivan's hand. He may want to clarify. Ivan, did, I didn't um, uh, apologize. The Ivan. State law as it relates to this resolution. Uh, he may want to remark. I'm not intending to put him on the spot. However, your second action, uh, should you elect to take it after first uh, looking at the general plan amendment, if that is to pass, then your second action by virtue of the fact we've received, we believe. Um, 20% of uh, petitions from 20% of the surrounding property owners within 300 feet. The action on the zoning ordinance amendment would have to be by supermajority. And of course, Mayor, I'd respond to any questions you, you may have. I know that uh, Mary tried to catch my eye a couple of times. Mary, Mary. There was a, a question from the audience that I would like to address uh, regarding secondary access. As you know, uh, we work very close, closely with the local fire district. They have a fire marshal that reviews uh, information that we distribute. There are specific stipulations regarding widths of roads, um, the uh, shoulders for those roads, so as to be able to accommodate emergency vehicle access. Those roads will be built to the fire marshal standards, and they have identified specifically what those standards are because both of these properties reside at the end of cul-de-sacs. So that is a major issue. There are also discussions about potentially having uh, improvements on the golf course to where you could drive the fire truck literally across a semi-improved road uh, to be able to get in there as a secondary access. Those will be the technical aspects of the next submittal when the Planning Commission reviews first the final development plan before it comes before uh, this body. Thank you. Mary had a question? Yeah, I have a couple. So they kind of answered one question, which is what I thought is, I, I have a majority here of the county, but the halls are in Prescott Valley. Is that correct? Am, am I understanding this correctly? You are correct that the uh, halls property that you're considering is in the town of Prescott Valley. Okay. And the, the golf course, back when, has it always had this idea? Is it, we have a general plan in our town. It gives us a road map, kind of an idea. The citizens voted on that, where they wanted to go, the direction our town is going. We mentioned that the general plan um, talks a little bit about this area. Is this part of? Yes, it's part of the town's general plan. It's identified for low density development. That's the reason why the application has come to you because they're proposing a change in that designation. Very uh, similar to other actions that the Planning and Zoning Commission has reviewed for you and recommended to you. You first must uh, take a step in the broad view, does this make sense from a general plan standpoint before you actually enact an ordinance or approve an ordinance that's based on state law. Um, 
the county does have also plans and we'd work closely with them when they were developing their general plan we focus a little more detail because we have a smaller geographic area that we deal with than Yavapai County in its entirety. But uh, yes, uh, this is part of the town's general plan. Good. So, well, I'm sorry, Mayor, one more question. Yeah, I'm sorry. So, in regards to the rights of land and to develop land, I'm trying to understand, I understand the people here do not want this to happen, but I'm trying to understand the rights on the other side as well when you buy land and you have that right to develop it. I'm just trying to balance this here. Um, the town is obligated to apply a zoning district, uh, the closest available district and densities that exist when the town annexes a piece of property. So you've probably read um, when we undertake such a process, we researched from the county their records and actually we went to the county and pulled all of those. I have some uh, very unique uh, experience there. I worked for the county for a long time. So I knew where those documents were. We researched those documents and that was the basis that we applied zoning to the country club. We also recognized a uh, ordinance that was passed by the Board of Supervisors coincidentally while I was working there that identified 75 units on the golf course. They did relegate them to the Cottonwood Cove area. There are 75 units permitted on that golf course. What is being proposed again is the bifurcation or separation of the two into two areas, remaining 30 where they previously, 35 where they previously were approved and moving 40 to this location. Both those actions are subject uh, of your review, and that's a general plan amendment for parcel B and subsequently zoning. Good. Laura had a question. I do. <clears throat> um, I was at a ribbon cutting this morning with a lot of people uh, for a project that started out very controversial. And uh, it was delightful today to be there to see the turnaround and how excited people were. Um, how that relates to <clears throat> tonight's question is there were representatives of the fire department there, and so I decided to talk to them about this situation because I couldn't understand if all of your fears were based in total documented reality why a fire department would not be speaking up and telling us uh, that's not a good idea. That is not what I heard. So I'm asking you directly, we are this far along in this process, and clearly the fire department says that there's turning access radius, there's all of the things that are needed that they're saying don't exist. Well, I, I can share with you that it's in the file documented, the letters from uh, the fire marshal, I won't use his name. Uh, he is an expert in that respect, and we regard highly their recommendations, we follow them. And I wouldn't be standing in front of you, as you pointed out, suggesting this was a, a reasonable thing to consider if they had concerns that had not been addressed. Similarly, the, the traffic studies that were done were done in concert with Yavapai County because those roads are maintained by Yavapai County. So the developer responded to comments that we got from Yavapai County, the public works director and his professional staff. They also have a traffic engineer, so they speak a different language than I do. Jody probably speaks the same language. <clears throat> but they communicated and they came to a reasonable, I believe, conclusion. It took a long time. It took a lot of work. And um, so, again, if there were those significant concerns by the county, I wouldn't be standing here either. Correct. Thank you. Uh, the other thing, you know, we buy property and we don't always know a lot about the area around us. I bet and not many of you knew that in 1983, the county 
approved what's happening now. None of you knew that when you bought your property. And I'm sad about that. That's hard. But we follow the rule of law. We have to think about that. I'm a constitutionist, and I believe in the Constitution, and the Constitution gives certain rights. And we have to think about everyone's rights. Everyone's rights. Thank you. Ivan, you had a comment? Mr. Mayor and Council, it isn't often that Richard invites me to speak. <laughs> you know how he feels about lawyers. I no, no comment, David. I think he's given you actually some good advice. I should, uh, I, I hate to say that to him because that will give him a big head, but he's indicated to me that uh, uh, he is uh, recommending to you that even though he does not know if the 20% requirement has been met, he believes that we should go forward with the understanding that it has indeed been met. And uh, I agree with that recommendation. So when you take the vote on the uh, zoning issue, uh, if you get to that point, then it will require a supermajority, which uh, is 75% uh, of, uh, of, of seven, and that becomes six. Six uh, votes will be required. The first vote will be related to the general plan amendment, and that it does not require a supermajority. But when it comes down to the uh, to the rezoning, if you get to that next vote, that will require a supermajority. Thank you, Ivan. Any other questions? Any other? Uh, I guess so. Yeah, one more comment. You're number ten, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. I have a couple things that I'd like to state because I have letters in regards to this. And in regards to um, uh, the vice mayor, back in 1983, and I have the documents in the entirety, nothing was ever given an okay to parcel B. Parcel C, when it was twice the size, was given preliminary, providing that they left all the trees, that they did the work along Cripple Wash, that they completely addressed that. And now, through the roads department in the county, when they looked at the plans that they submitted for their little cul-de-sac, back and forth between Richard Parker, of which we have as public records information, they ask that they bring a road from the Clipper Wash down there from the Cottonwood Springs area on either side of the clubhouse to either access Tapadero or to access the other side. And I also have the letter from Jessica Hall that said absolutely not. They are not going to let them have that access. So that hasn't been decided. For all the parts for the roads and all those things, it's all preliminary. These are not final plans. It's sketch. And I've talked to Rick Chase at the fire department, and all the things have to be presented differently. Yes, they could do it if that's the way it is. It's not cut and dried, and you're being told that it's all out there and it's been fine. It has not. The traffic study for down Manzanita that the fellow here did, peak travel hours or peak travel time from 6.30 a.m. till 8.30, one car every three seconds, 4,700 cars a day down Manzanita. It will add to the traffic, it will add to the congestion, and it's not fair that you're being presented that all this has been answered, and it has not. And I have all those studies. We can present those to you, and you need to look at 1983. It was preliminary approval, wasn't laid in stone, and it was supposed to come back, and 40 years later, it has never come back. And the one thing that we've always said Joe Scott told me this the first day three years ago when he looked at this, the planner. He said, I do not understand. There are enough lots in Prescott Country Club to build 100 condominium units today. They have been approved for 40 years. And Mr. Hendrickson and his family own most of those lots. They've owned them for five, six, seven years. If it was such a need to rezone the middle of the country club to build condos, why don't they build up and down Tapadero? Why don't they build on the other lots that are already approved and have been approved for 40 years? Build their condos there. When they sell them out, when they've done all that, maybe then they can come back and ask for this. We're still asking you 
do not approve this because, and again, Mary, it's not on the town 2025 plan. That's one of the things they're asking you to vote on tonight is to move this into the Prescott Valley 2025. It's not there. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, Mike. I just had a couple questions. One was, uh, I'm not sure if there's an HOA in that community. Okay. And the other is, uh, when we heard the information about the traffic, uh, I, I would be interested to hear whether or not, what, cons what would you consider as the um, maxed out capacity of that roadway and whether or not we're that close or not? Okay, yes, I'd like to address some of the issues First of that, all, your name, that, you like. that came up. Again? Okay. Um, initially, we collected, we collected our, our data collection in July of 2015, which showed in the peak direction in the peak hour about 200 vehicles. And at that point, I think we got comments back from the residents and maybe also the county that stated we should do it when school is in, when there possibly could be higher traffic volumes. So in January of 2016, we collected intersection turning movement counts um, at, uh, at the main intersection. And that was shown to be consistent with what we collected in July. And then also what we did is we collected the intersection turning movements by video, and we sent that out to get, to get analyzed. And the volume that we showed on Manzanita was equal to about 3,100 vehicles per day, and that was consistent with previous traffic counts and studies that was done previously on Manzanita. And then also on uh, Prescott Country Club, uh, through, uh, there was 2000, in 2013 and also 2009, they had daily traffic counts of 5,200, and that was also consistent with what we collected uh, back in 2016. To analyze how traffic is performing, usually with the roadways, the intersections will cause the most delays. And where we analyze the, the, the four-way intersection <coughs> under existing conditions, it's operating at, during the peak hours, a level service A or B, depending upon what approach. So when we add the traffic to with the maximum traffic that could possibly come from these uh, developments, uh, that the level of service does not change and it remains at level service A or B. So when you look at the total traffic, you know, a delay per vehicle, that total delay in existing condition is about 9.5 seconds. When we add this traffic, and do our projections, it raises it at most one more second. So it's about a second or less than a second of average delay that if all vehicles were to enter this intersection, that's what it would cause. So the intersection and the roadway to me is operating at acceptable levels of service. <laughs> when typically a level service D would be any other questions? I do. I, I want to be clear. <clears throat> uh, you didn't just do traffic studies in January? We did it. We did the initial count at uh, Manzanita and Buena Vista in July 2015. But they're saying that was only done in January, so I needed to clarify. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you, Mr. Holland. Perfect. Okay. I got, I got one more comment, Mary? I got a question. Oh, okay. Sorry. Richard. Oh, that's all right. Did you? Yeah, if you use a microphone, then, yeah. That intersection is, just, is up by my house, and uh, that's the only one that did. That's a problem, along with the other one. You go down to Manzanita Trail and uh, Prescott Valley Parkway, a four-way stop sign, which 
Everything coming out of Country Club goes through there. Then you go 150 yards past Maverick to the stoplight at 69. But that is one hell of an intersection. And, I, and regardless of how you guys vote here, you ought to take a look at that area because it's terrific. I mean, people are just mad, okay? And they have not studied that. They haven't looked at it. And you're just getting piecemeal stuff. Right. And uh, it's this whole smoke and mirrors deal again. Good, thank you. Other questions, anyone? Oh, Any last? I, I'm I, sorry, one I'm more. I'm sorry, I, yeah. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm just trying, I, I guess where I'm really kind of stuck at here is I'm seeing people with property. And I'm understanding that as property, you have a right to do, to keep your property or to sell your property or maybe develop your property. So I'm just trying to understand if the gentleman, let's just say didn't want to put condos, wanted to develop something, he can develop this in whatever he'd like to do. I mean, I, I'm, I just feel like we have a lot of issues. We, we have traffic we're talking about, and, and, and there was visions way back when, and nothing's going to stay the same. We all know that. I'm trying to get to a bottom of probably the right to do as you'd like with the property that you invested in. Can, can you help me out here? Because that's well, where I'm you, really I'll struggling. try to answer it in a couple of ways. There is an entitlement uh, on the golf, car, golf course for 75 units. It happens to be in the area we've referred to as C, which is their uh, maintenance facility. There has been discussions about it has shrunk. Well, certainly if in the past it was six acres, we would recognize that original parcel configuration that was presented to the county. So if they wanted to develop that property, they would come through the town of Prescott Valley. We would honor that condition. We'd go through the Planning and Zoning Commission as we have done with Parcel C. We would uh, vet the, the development that occurred or was being proposed, making sure that they address the technical issues that we have all discussed today, probably including traffic. That would go through the Planning and Zoning Commission and come to you with an existing zoning entitlement. What you're being asked to do is look at moving a portion of that entitlement to a different location on the property. So there is 75 units approved on the golf course. You're being asked to move 40 of those units to another location and retain the 35 where they previously were propo proposed at a uh, unit count of 75. They have a right to develop that uh, number of units on the golf course. Anywhere that they might decide to no. choose. They have the ability. That's the reason why you're looking at a general no. plan amendment. No, yeah, I know that. But I'm, what I'm asking is that it's their property to develop. They do have to come and ask these permissions. I understand that. But they do have a right to change it up. They, maybe well, they, they have a right to place them in Area C off of Cottonwood Cove. That's a vested zoning right. They would have to meet our standards, of course. They're asking to move a portion of that vested right another location on their private property. And that area B is proposed for 40 units, and they would retain 35 units elsewhere. That's the subject of your general plan amendment. And then subsequently, if you approve that, that would be subject of your zoning entitlement. On their private property. On their private property, yes, ma'am. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I have Why? one. Okay, uh, the general plan amendment that we're going to be voting on uh, basically wants us to go from low density to medium density. Okay, what would be the number to keep it as a low density? Uh, low density would be something under 10. Okay, thank you. Good, other questions? Mike? Yeah, I just had a, a comment. I wanted to uh, kind of relate my uh, experience as well. And I think this is, is, is a common experience in planned communities. I live in one here just south of uh, 
69 and we've gone through some changes in developers just like you have and I think when we were first uh, working with a developer and believe me we had just as much com you know I think uh, committed people passionate folks that uh, wanted to provide their input to the developer but I think what Mary is trying to say is in general that person owns a property and pretty much can determine where and how he would like to do that and then come to the uh, town to uh, uh, discuss that, lay it out, and determine what's going to work for both the town and for the developer. But in this case, you know, I think one of the first topics of discussion was the golf course. And uh, I think there was, uh, uh, and we have probably the same number you have in your community right now, about 3,000. And uh, there were pros and cons, and I think some people were willing to see that golf course go brown. Because the option was at that point the developer said, well, we would like you, the HOA or, or residents of our community, to uh, cover the cost of that golf course. And so, you know, you're met with decisions. Well, do we want the golf course or do we not? And what are the options that we can get involved? Well, obviously that didn't happen. But I can hear from your perspective, you still want that golf course. I think from the other perspective, the owner of the golf course has to deal with uh, contingencies relative to supporting that as a functioning uh, uh, business. And so that costs money. So they, I, I suspect, are looking at ways to supplement uh, the upkeep and the uh, ongoing uh, functioning of that golf course. And sometimes it's going to take other things to make that happen. But uh, some of the, the other things that they told us as far as options was uh, that if if the developer could not proceed uh, with uh, uh, maintaining that golf course, the bottom line is, and he's indicated this, he would start building homes on that golf course. And he has every right to consider that. You know, and I think we're in the lurch. You know, the HOA is one way to deal with that in a, a legal manner and with uh, uh, residents of that community and we felt I think the same way you did but we actually had a committee that worked with a developer to hash these out and I think it's worked out very well in the long term but again these are not unusual issues and in our community we're about 10 years old obviously you're uh, uh, an older community and I think it's just something that we all deal with of, of, as residents in in different planned communities and you know, I think it's it's hard to, to um, uh, look at both sides and, and get an idea how this is going to affect me. I think bottom line right now in my community, the developer is looking at multifamily homes. And there are areas in that community that has been have been specified since 1998 in terms of their plans for them to do that. And they've all actually looked at, well, how can we maybe change the density and change some of those around the community as opposed to where they were back in 1998. And I think we all know things change over time, and uh, golf courses seem to be kind of the linchpin in terms of how some of those things work. So I, I feel for you and do appreciate your input uh, and your petitions and understand, I think, where you're coming from. And uh, as Mary is trying to indicate, too, we're trying to look at this balance between the, the owner of the uh, uh, the golf course as well as the owners of the the homes in that community and so uh, hopefully I think there, there looks like there have been compro some compromise over the last three years and you've been going through this uh, you know I think for 34 years and to me this seems to be a logical progression how it it is settled I don't know you know I'm, we're gonna make that decision tonight but uh, don't feel as though you're alone and even though you're not part of our community we feel that you're one of our neighbors so don't feel as though we don't want to consider your uh, issues seriously as we would anybody else so thank you for coming tonight council member mallory will take one more comment i just i just want all of you to know as well when the lady came up and said that you know they don't have you don't have representation well i understand i'm not your elected person but i want you to know i do care my the line from Prescott Valley to the country club that's insignificant to me I care about this community as a whole and there are no lines for me 
And I want you to know that with every bit of my heart, I am up here trying to balance out the understanding of both sides. So don't think you came here without someone or listening to you, because we are listening to you. We really are. I think with that, I'm going to... Uh... I appreciate very much seconds. what you said. I have been in real estate myself for 25 years, and my father was a broker for 40 years. All I ever did was work with developers, but I never, ever approached or worked a project that was going to destroy the adjacent property owners. And that's very clearly what the Arizona Constitution says. They have a right to develop the property, but not to destroy the subsequent people property's values. And when a town or municipality votes to do that, and the consequences are that they lose, that's what the Goldwater Institute did, that's what Prop 207 is, it gave the people a right to sue the town or the municipality for destruction of values. And any time I worked with developers, and a lot in this area, if we came across problems where the roads weren't going to be right, we weren't going to have the easement, I would tell them, let's go find something else. So yes, they have a right for the Cottonwood Springs, no, they don't have a right for Parcel B, which was open space, but they do not have a right to destroy people's values, their property values. And that's the last I'll say. Thank, Thank you, Mary. Okay. With that, I'm going to uh, declare the public hearing ended. Move on to number C, consideration of approving resolution number 2015, approving general plan amendment GPA 14006, Prescott or PCC condos, parcel B. Any uh, comments there, uh, Richard? Any questions on the council or uh, motions or demotions or commotions or promotions? Anyone? Jody? Mayor, I would make a motion of authorizing Mayor or in his absence, the Vice Mayor to sign resolution number 2015, approving the general plan amendment GPA 14-006, PCC condos, parcel B. I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Would you set the vote, Diane? Councilmember Anderson? Yes. Councilmember Rooney? Yes. Pass? That is unanimously passed, Mayor. Okay, thank you. We move on to number D, public hearing again, zoning map change, ZMC-14006, PCC condos, parcel B. Richard? Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, this uh, regards parcel B, as you've discussed in some detail and was last subject of your motion for the general plan amendment. Uh, this motion has to be done by a supermajority, as we've discussed. I would help you respond to any questions from the audience or at your direction, questions from you, Mr. Mayor, or members of the council. Questions from the audience, you said, or the council? Any questions, anyone? Any comments? Motions? I think it's important Evan, to point out comment? this is a public hearing, so you would need to open the public oh, hearing sorry, for public, discussion. Yeah, we'll, uh, I'm sorry, we'll open the uh, public hearing again. Any more uh, comments? <coughs> the public any question if there is none then I would uh, declare the public hearing closed and we move on to uh, e consideration of approving the reading of ordinance number 835 by title only on two separate occasions then place the same one final passage approving ZMC 14006 we do need a motion on that, if and if there's questions, Mike. Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion to read ordinance number 835 by title only on two separate occasions and then place the same on final passage, approving ZMC 14-006. Second, anyone? Ready? I'll second. We have a motion and a second. Would you set the vote, Dan? Councilmember Rooney? 
Yes. Yes. Councilmember Anderson. Yes. That passes unanimously, Mayor. Okay, with that, I would ask you, Diane, to read the ordinance, the ordinance by title only for the first reading. Diane. Ordinance number 835, an ordinance of the mayor and the common council of the town of Prescott Valley, a municipal corporation of Arizona, amending town zoning map ZMC 14-006 by changing the zoning classification of approximately 4.18 acre portion of the Prescott Country Club, generally referred to as parcel B or the triangle area from R1L pad residential single family limited planned area development zoning to R2 pad residential multiple dwelling units planned area development zoning and providing that this ordinance shall be effective 30 days after its passage and approval according to law. Thank you, Diane. Okay, move on to number F. Again, a public hearing. Zoning map change ZNC 17. Uh, is this going to be the, is that the first reading or is that first and second reading? Are you going to read it again? When will you read it again? That's what I want to know. It will come up for second reading in two weeks. Here? At the next council meeting. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, we've gone to, uh, again, public hearing on ZMC 17-002. Mayor, if you'd indulge me, maybe we'd get uh, just a minute to clear the room because uh, we do have other business. I think there's some people who want to leave. Is on Winsong Senior Living. Uh, thank you all. We'll uh, declare the public hearing open. Thank you, Mr. Your Mayor. Comments, Richard? Yes, I'd like to first um, recognize uh, Jeffrey uh, Fletcher. Is Jeffrey here? There he is. He gets an award because uh, he sat through the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting uh, awaiting his approval for several he's, hours he's used to it yeah and now we punished him again um, but we're very very uh, excited to present this to you uh, this is in downtown Prescott Valley on Winsong as you can see from the illustration or in your packet and proposed is a uh, assisted living facility I think with memory care as well I was teasing Larry the other day that it'll be great for him because he doesn't have to walk too far uh, when he gets uh, mixed up and he thinks he's coming to work at the town as the town manager when he gets a little older. But uh, this could be a great place for him to move. This is a site layout, and of course, uh, for those who are familiar with the property, it's immediately adjacent to the Samaritan um, facility. And we believe, as, as the town staff, that this uh, is complementary uh, to those uses. The Planning and Zoning Commission uh, reviewed uh, this matter and unanimously recommended approval uh, to you of the zoning map change. Uh, they also, at the same meeting, uh, approved a preliminary development plan. Um, and we are in hopes that we have a final development plan in front of you here very shortly. I would respond, Mr. Mayor, to any questions you or the council may have, and I'm very uh, pleased to introduce uh, Mr. F uh, Fletcher to the, the town council and you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Fletcher, welcome. Anyone have any questions on Mr. Fletcher? And then your comments first. Well, thank you for having me. We've been treated very gracefully by the town, uh, and we appreciate that. Uh, Novo Senior Living Properties, I'm probably the least important, least important person with this project. This is very an operationally intensive medical community with hospitality services, and it's designed to provide an affordable alternative to some things that you see that are going on around the, in other parts of uh, the community. Uh, to the point Richard made, it will have uh, 92 units, 108 beds, split roughly a third, a third, a third with uh, independent living, assisted living, and memory care. Uh, DHS will license the entire community for directed care, uh, but we'll differentiate care segments for what we refer to as a hybrid type of a community 
so that folks with independent living needs that may have one or two activities of daily living, whether it's uh, with eating or dressing or other matters, uh, can be taken care of. Uh, with assisted living, that's typically three to four different ADLs, activities of daily living. Um, we have started, we started on this, uh, investigating this two years ago. And at the time, the Good Sam community just to our south, I believe had 14 of their beds designated as a secure memory care unit. And our current understanding is that those have now been con converted to uh, skilled nursing. So currently in Prescott Valley proper, there is no memory care. Uh, and we've also originally approached this project with assisted living and memory care only and through uh, several now, through originally in July of 2016 and more recently this year in market studies, we originally looked at 3.38 acres and assisted living memory care only and then following those studies determined that there is a really signif significant unmet demand for independent living. So we took our time, uh, we thought, uh, were thoughtful about it uh, and really looking to come in and provide uh, a nice addition to the community that has each of those care segments. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions, anyone? Laura? I don't really have a question, but I'm just so relieved this is happening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I may be one of those. <laughs> Especially after tonight, it may come on a little sooner. <laughs> and. Uh, I'm proud of our community, and we, while we're a younger community than other, others in Yavapai County, we still have desperate need for this. So I just want to thank you for all the work you've done, and obviously I'm going to support it. Rick. Thank you. Well, I just want to thank you for considering our community when you brought this to us. Uh, it is something we can certainly use. And I'm just grateful to see people bring this type of, of project to Prescott Valley. Thank you. Good. Mike? Yeah, I just wanted to say, too, we appreciate your willingness to come to our community and look at the needs that we have and, and we're willing to address those. And I think that's where you're looking to uh, place that facility is, is along our medical corridor, which is just a perfect place. And I think... Uh, it was probably made for your facility, so I'm looking forward uh, to that. And and uh, as you know, we just upgraded the uh, the street along there, so I think it's, it provides for more access in terms of your uh, activities you're thinking about in terms of ADL. So uh, uh, I think it's just a perfect place, and, and uh, we look forward to the development. Thank you. Good, thank you. Jody? The timing is good, and it's appreciated. Thank you. Good. Mary? Yes. Thank you very much. And I have to agree with Laura Lena. I may need that sooner than I think either after tonight. So thank you. Good. Marty? Uh, again, it's, uh, you know, based on your study and what you've done, it's, uh, it's something that is necessary in the community. And it's nice that even though Good Sam reduced their beds, you are now bringing new beds to the community. And uh, I think this will be a, uh, a well-used facility, um, unfortunately, but it will be well-used. So thank you for bringing it to us. And as Rick said, thank you for considering it in our community. Thank you. Any other comments in the public? I feel like nobody's raising up against you tonight. I think everybody's pretty happy with the project. <laughs> happy to take reservations. Huh? Yeah, uh, <laughs> come on up, your comments. <laughs> okay, we'll get the okay. Good to see you. Hi, I'm Fran Bailey, and I just am supporting him because we moved down here a year and a half ago from Colorado. We lived in Montrose, and they had facility exactly like this and my mother uh, lived there and it was wonderful for her to be able to go from independent living to uh, an Alzheimer's facility that was there and it wasn't changing her and moving her from one town to another so it really is important to have that here in Prescott Valley so well, I 
Thank you and welcome. <laughs> Good. Anything else, anyone? If there's a, if there's no uh, further, anything else, Jeffrey, Richard? If there's no other comment, then I'm going to declare the public hearing closed, and we'll move on to G, and that's consideration of reading ordinance number 836 by title only on two separate occasions, and then place the same on final passage, approving zoning map change A ZMC 17002, Winsong Senior Living. I'd like to make a motion if there's no other. Motion to read ordinance number 836 by title only on two separate occasions and then place the same on final passage approving zoning map change ZMC 17-002, Winsong Senior Living by electronic and voice vote. I would like to second. Okay, the motion to second. Would you set the vote? Diane? Councilmember Rooney? Yes. Councilmember Anderson? Yes. Mayor, that passes unanimously. I bet you were worried, weren't you? <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, well, uh, with, with that, I'll ask Diane to read uh, the ordinance by title only for the first reading. Diane? Ordinance number 836, an ordinance of the mayor and the common council of the town of Prescott Valley, a municipal corporation of Arizona, amending the town zoning map to change the zoning classification of an approximately 4.78 acre parcel located on the west side of Winsong Drive, approximately 900 feet south of Lakeshore Drive, from C1 Pad Commercial Neighborhood Sales and Services Planned, to, zo to RS PAD, Residential and Services Planned Area Development Zoning, and providing that this ordinance shall be effective 30 days after its passage and approval according to law. Thank you, Diane. With that, we'll move on to H, consideration of approving resolution number 2014, adopting policy number 1-01, -01, wireless facilities and collocation right away. Good evening, Mayor Council. Arm, you're up. The item you do have before you is about wireless facilities location. So if I can synopsize a little bit what this council action is, is council may recall, or in the late uh, 1990s, actually 1998, council adopted a policy standards for large cell tower siting within Prescott Valley. So they went through an exhaustive process, and basically these um, wireless facilities could be located on public lands, and that required a zoning requirement. So it was a process in order to locate those on public lands. What's going on since that time? Obviously, since 1998, lots of cell uh, or wireless facilities has gone into Prescott Valley, and there's coverage for cell uh, phones. Well, that coverage is uh, pretty good. I think you've seen lots of advancements through the cell towers, not only in Prescott Valley, but throughout the nation. What this item you have before you specifically is what this um, wireless providers are telling us is in certain hot spots, they don't have good enough coverage. So what that means is uh, areas of significant high cell phone traffic like next to a stadium during a football game or near a hospital or a large office building there's just too much uh, cell usage that large towers can't actually it'll drop a call so what's gone on is the uh, wireless providers have said they would like to uh, in these hot spots they call them is locate uh, what they call uh, small wireless facilities very small or I guess the acronym they use is um, SWF to make sure I do that right for small wireless facilities so what it is it takes care of those little hot spots what they've done is uh, this last legislative session in order to help the wireless uh, facility um, vendors is they've passed that those actual facilities small in nature can go on utility poles within rights of way so prior to that time uh, you had to have go through zoning well the new state law that was passed this last legislative session said that these small facilities can go on existing um, poles in the right of way are streetlight poles, so to speak, but have limitations on what the size can be because they're just supposed to be for the small hot spots. So this was a bill that went through the legislature. There is a deadline that we have to set new policies per the state law uh, by uh, this February of 18. So our uh, town legal department has worked long on coming up with a new policy, and which in addition to the large facilities is what would be a policy for co-location in rights of way for small wireless facilities. For these particular hotspots, so 
it is a change, uh, just an addition to our current policy for these small facilities. I know Ivan and the legal department has worked a long time on this, so if there's anything I think Ivan would like to add, it would be a good time too. Back in the late 90s, we thought we had this figured out. Uh, that was uh, the effort that you went through and uh, had a study done, and we brought in um, uh, Mr. Uh, Nye, who was uh, an expert in that area. And he uh, worked with us to set up the process that we have in place where we made sure that uh, wireless facilities uh, had easy access to the PL zones and could uh, use those areas without having to go through rezoning, simply through a, a lease. And uh, he, uh, we gave him a first right of refusal, and he would go out and, and then enter into subleases with uh, these companies that were, that were uh, taking care of, of the facilities and providing the service. The, one of the beauties of that was that we were kind of centralizing those facilities on the uh, public properties where they typically weren't quite as close to residential areas and we thought we were accomplishing many good things by, by centralizing that, making it an easy process. Uh, they could still go in the commercial areas if they chose to, but they didn't have the right to do that. They then had to go through a rezoning process. And uh, it also brought some revenue to the public facilities, and so it was a good way to, to do things. <clears throat> What's happened is that this uh, technology change where the providers now want to have many more facilities and have looked hungrily at the public rights of way and said we can we can go in there and we can start having many many of these on uh, existing poles uh, that didn't quite work well for this system that we had set up because the rights of way uh, take on the zoning characteristics of the property next to them so uh, most of our public rights of way are in commercial or residential zones. And we then didn't have a mechanism, a means, for uh, allowing those facilities to come in. Uh, the legislature basically took that away from us and said, fine, you've got your system in place, that's all well and good, but we're now going to basically tell you you must allow these in the right of way, uh, regardless of what other conditions you might want to apply. And uh, we're going to also tell you that you've got to do it for a certain price. Uh, you can't do it uh, based on any concept of owning the right-of-way. Uh, the right-of-way is just there for this technology, and we want to favor the technology. So, uh, and, and Larry's whispering in my ear, being the technologist that he is, uh, he, he loves that to a certain extent. So what we needed to do was we, we could either completely undo the system that had been set up in the 1990s or we could come up with two systems. And that's essentially what we've done. Uh, we still have in place the system that was uh, put together uh, in the 90s. Um, but when it comes to the right-of-way, regardless of what the zoning might be, state law supersedes that. And so this policy that we've adopted will now attempt to comply with the state statute and policy and allow these facilities in the right-of-way as the state has mandated they should be allowed. Larry? Yes, uh, Mayor and Council, uh, one thing that I discovered at the, uh, the League of Cities is that this is an interim step. Okay, there's a pilot project going on in Yuma right now yes. uh, that is going to completely undo uh, systems that are in place and be replaced by a very tight grid in a community, uh, there will be no dead spots. There will be uh, no, no difficulties. And so quite frankly, what we passed in the late 90s has survived nearly 20 years. And in the world of technology, that's amazing. And so we just need to be agile enough to uh, stay up with state law, one, and then number two, work well with all the different providers because our community wants it. Our community wants to have great coverage. They want 5G, not 4G. And they don't want to drop calls like Mary does when she calls me. And uh, so you know, what it is is the technology continues to evolve. 
the wonderful <coughs> thing is that uh, I, I will predict that in a very short period of time, on top of every street light we have, you're going to have a device that is this size, but only about only about two inches thicker. Yeah. That's all it is, and it sits on top of the street light plugs into the power that runs the street light, and that's all it's going to take. It's not going to take any device on the ground uh, to go ahead and power it. It will be getting its, if this pilot project works, and they're doing it in four cities right now, and the city of Yuma is going to uh, share in the benefit because this little device that sits on top of the street light uh, will serve Sprint, Verizon, all of those mm -hmm. different companies will rent space in this little device. And then there will also be some benefits for law enforcement over the long term. So anyway, technology's changing. We will benefit, uh, but more importantly, the citizens will have much better Mary support. has an objection. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't have a chip, does it? No, I'm... Um... <laughs> So we're going to buy, are we the ones that will have to buy those devices? I'm just asking. Just, no, you know. no, not at all. And, and oh, the, good. Oh. The, the beautiful thing is there was a movement from cities and towns 15, 20 years ago. And uh, companies were trying to get cities and towns to invest millions of dollars putting in systems to accommodate uh, uh, technology. And there were a number of cities that bought into that and right now they're regretting it seriously because technology has changed so dramatically they don't need what was put in by those cities and towns that went into uh, serious debt to cause that to happen. These little devices that you will see on streetlights uh, make all of that outdated and it doesn't cost us. In fact, we will generate revenue off of these sitting on streetlights. Okay. I was going to share all that with you, but I'll, I was there with him in that session. The best news of all is we don't have to retrofit anything. They are designed to fit on what we already have. And I was on the edge of my seat. I didn't understand half of the technology, but I am so excited for us. Rick? Well, I was just wondering, since the state's in such a magnanimous <laughs> mood, if they might talk to APS and see if they can't keep my power on yeah. <laughs> all the time. Since they want to force everybody to do everything, if they might, you know, it's gone off four times this week, so yep. perhaps they could just keep it going more often. That would be nice. <laughs> and they could throw direct TV in on that deal, and uh, I wouldn't have to have them come out every month and... and readjust my never mind, never mind. yeah it doesn't like hail at all Mar let's Marty. let everybody go home tonight <laughs> Marty had a comment no any other Rich, I, Richard I think we're all punching there <laughs> I, I, I couldn't resist um, because when Larry gets lost coming from the memory care facility we just need to make sure <laughs> Just need to make sure that he has a cell phone in his pocket because at every street light we'll know where he is at each interval. So I think it's a really great idea. Uh, <laughs> Mary, you're uh, lost, did you see? No, I just, it just cracked me up. Okay. Do we need a motion? Can we move on? We need a motion. I think I want to make a motion. Motion to authorize the mayor, or in his absence, the vice mayor, to sign resolution number 2014, adopting policy number 1-01, wireless facilities and collocations right of ways by electronic and voice vote. Second, anyone? I'll second that, Mayor. Okay, with a motion and a second, would you set the vote, Dan? Councilmember Anderson? Yes. Councilmember Rooney? Yes. That is approved unanimously, Mayor. Um, put her in. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, we'll move on to I, consideration of approving a budget transfer from police operating budget line items to police CIS capital budget line. Mr. Gregory. 
You got to give us something <laughs> special. You waited. Right. And on the technology portion of it, Larry, we do have the bracelets that we also can track you with, too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Larry's got his ankle bracelet. Does that count? Well, the, um, the Prescott Valley Criminal Investigation... You and I used a microphone just a little closer. There you go. The uh, Prescott Valley Criminal Investigation Division is requesting to purchase uh, forensic computer software that will allow us to download data from cell phones and also uh, iPads, and it will greatly enhance our ability for criminal investigations to download all that information. Um, the technology is changing year to year, and the software we have now is not up with the technology. And this uh, Celebrite software will allow us to download all images, the data from the phones, text messages, um, will greatly enhance our ability for to download that information when we do search warrants and things like that and collect evidence of these um, mobile data d devices. So what we're requesting to do is also this um, technology will allow us to break uh, passwords, um, not on the Apple phones, but on the Android phones. It will allow us to do that. So that helps us greatly because a lot of times people don't cooperate with law enforcement on giving us their passwords. Um, we're requesting to uh, uh, budget transfer an amount of $12,935 in operating funds to capital funds to complete the purchase of this software. Um, $10,150 will come from the Animal Control Professional Services budget. We had salary savings in that. And then the additional $2,785 from the evidence maintenance agreement we have with uh, our evidence.com, we have uh, $2,785 of savings there. So we're requesting that transfer will, will greatly help us out in criminal investigations. Questions, anyone? Sound like Marty, come in. I have a question. I'll make a motion. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let, let it rip. I'll make a motion to approve a budget transfer from the police operating budget line items to the police CIS capital budget line by electronic and voice vote. I'll second. Okay, with a motion and a second, would you set the vote? Councilmember Rooney? Yes. Councilmember Anderson? Yes. That passes unanimously, Mayor. Gregory, go for it. Appreciate it. Okay, we have. Uh, well, we're not done yet. We have number number eleven. Consideration and discussion of general unscheduled comments from the public. Those wishing to address the council need not request permission in advance. Any such remarks shall be addressed to the council as a whole and not to any member thereof. Such remarks shall be limited to five minutes, unless additional time is granted by the mayor. Yes, sir. Come on up. Welcome. Good to see you. Thank you. My name's Adam England, and uh, hopefully we have something a little bit lighter than, than the weight of some of the topics this evening. Um, did I understand correctly that you guys can't see what we are presenting? Would it still be okay if I presented for the audience and, and if sure. you guys wanted to turn around? Okay. <laughs> well, that's... Uh, Updating there. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm Adam England. Thank you for having me, Mr. Mayor, council members, other dignitaries of, uh, of the town. Um, nearly lifelong resident of the town of Prescott Valley, um, having graduated the Humboldt school system, grown up with uh, some of your children. Uh, Ivan, I've probably pilfered more out of your fridge and pantry than I'd like to admit during my high school years, <laughs> um, hanging out with his, with his kids. Uh, but tonight I'm here as a volunteer of the Prescott Astronomy Club. And we wanted to really just give a big thank you to the town and you guys in particular for your partnership with us over the years. Uh, we like to share our passion for stargazing and we usually do that three to four times a year at Pronghorn Park at the, the beautiful facilities there. And we have free, fun, educational events that we invite the public to come out to and, and uh, look at the sky and see, what, see what's out there a little bit further than, than things that are a close distance here on Earth. Uh, recently on August 21st, the celestial mechanics of our solar system aligned in a way that allowed us to experience an eclipse. And while here in Presque Valley we weren't able to see a total eclipse, uh, we did get about a 75 percent eclipse and we had a great time. And it turned out to be the largest event that the Prescott Astronomy Club has ever gotten to put on. And we were very happy to be able to do that. Mr. Mayor, you came out and we chatted a little bit and, and I know everybody had a good time. So we just wanted to share a few uh, slides of the event and, and really just say thank you.
time. <laughs> While you're loading that, yeah. I came, I was there for part of it, and then I had to go up to my office on the fourth floor. I took a lot of pictures of what was happening down there and sent it out on Facebook. And I may have stolen one of those pictures from your <laughs> Facebook page. It and was a great view looking over the whole grass I area. know, and it was so much fun how people responded. They were jealous. It was amazing. Yes. It was, it was an amazing opportunity for the community. Now, let's see if this thing will. So leading up to the event, we did a lot of uh, advertising and whatnot. We got on local TV and radio. Uh, we were the feature article in the August 5 Census magazine. The morning of, we had our volunteers uh, lining up about 6 a.m. getting ready. We had a welcome booth here by the, the amphitheater stage. We had uh, volunteers uh, documenting the event from the uh, photo clubs locally. The line started before we were setting up at 6. There was already people in line waiting to get their Eclipse glasses and, and to experience. We got there early, started setting up. We did this fun event leading from the, the entrance here by the amphitheater stage out to the parking lot, and we did a scale replica of the solar system with pacing for each, each planet leading out from the sun. And when they started coming, they started coming. Uh, we estimated that there was approximately 4,000 people in attendance throughout the day that, that either came for the whole duration of the three-hour event or they, they came for a few minutes here and there. Many of them were, were students. We estimated about 1,500 K through 12 students that attended the event as field trips. People brought their blankets, their chairs. Some just laid on the ground and enjoyed. People looked through the telescopes. We had educational events showing the uh, way that the, the lunar phases work as viewed from Earth, the history of eclipses, how the celestial mechanics line up with the sun, the stars, the moon, the Earth and even the history. We made pinhole viewers. We had sponsorships from local businesses that allowed us to have projects hands-on for the kids. They made these fun sketches with, with chalk to show the corona of the sun, and then they also made some uh, bookmarks. Uh, one of our best partners in the event was the library, so of course we had to have bookmarks. The library brought out their 3D printer, which was a big hit with, with the community. The kids got to watch as uh, they made a little baby Groot from the Guardians of the Galaxy movie, but in the days prior they had made a replica of the Hubble and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which was really neat. We had the Heritage Park Zoo in attendance. They had a desert tortoise. They had prairie dogs. They had some insects and, and other animals talking about how they react to, to uh, eclipses, as well as the owl. He was the, the favorite. <laughs> The skies did threaten us that day, but as it would clear out, immediately you would hear the gas from the audience and people would look up and, and the ahs and oohs coming from the crowd was amazing. Everybody came and had a, a great time, everybody from all ages, even dogs. And despite things that were going around in social media, dogs do not look at the sun. And no <laughs> dog's eyes were damaged during the, the course of the eclipse. <laughs> Everybody wanted to document the event, and even though we had our photographers, everybody had their cell phones out coming up to the telescopes trying to get a picture. Some of these might be the ones that uh, I, I pilfered from you. Many of the students came in color-coordinated so that we could keep an eye on them, and even then, it was extremely hard. There's only so many colors. We gave away a telescope. We found this young lady who was so enthralled with uh, astronomy that we, we gave her a telescope as she's attending NAU as a freshman this year. Oh, that's awesome. This was all of our partners throughout the day. We had a great time. We had schools come from as far away as Camp Verde, Prescott, uh, Chino, Prescott Valley, of course. And that was our volunteers for the day. So we just wanted to say thank you for allowing us to, to participate in this on your premises. Mr. Mayor, you mentioned that many times things come at a cost to the town, and this didn't really cost the town anything other than some tables and canopies that you already had. We were able to secure donations and, and volunteer time, and that's what really counts. So thank you. Just keep it up. Keep bringing people in. 
We'll, we'll keep doing it. Appreciate that. It was a very proud day. My family down in Phoenix, of course, who looked at the Facebook were very jealous. And they right. said, you know, someday maybe we can retire and go there too. Everybody should be jealous of Prescott Valley. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Comments? Well, thank you for waiting out, by the way. Laura mentions. Oh, greetings. Good to see you. Greetings. It's been a long night. It reminded me why I don't come to council meetings too often. <laughs> this was exceptional. This I did it is for rare. This it's is rare. Unusual. I did it for over 30 years. So oh, well, bless I, you uh, for that. I swear that I'd never come to another one once I retired. So it should tell you that this is important why I'm here as um, I was glad to see in the in the flyer that just came out with a water bill uh, about the town and their flood control and drainage plans because that's what I want to talk about something along those lines I was also glad to hear the the vice mayor say that we follow the law because that's part of what we want to talk about tonight too um, we come to, to you tonight as citizens of Prescott Valley uh, because we need your help these people right along here are all uh, from North Sable Way in uh, Pronghorn Ranch. Um, What's the name of the street? North, North Sable, Way. Sable Way. You can't say it real fast. But, um, we've been trying to work through the, de the developer and uh, the town. Uh, the town's been very cooperative, just so you know, your staff is, is very good. I have no complaints there. But the developer has basically told us that um, he's chosen to ignore us and he refuses to work with us rather than to assure us that the work he's doing is going to be quality work and it's going to uh, actually keep us safe. Uh, Dorn Homes is, uh, oh, and just so you know, we're not anti-development, but we are anti-shoddy development. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight, if i got a few minutes here. Um, Dorn Homes is developing land uh, just north of North Sable Way. Uh, there's a drainage ditch, a drainage channel that separates our property from, uh, from theirs. Uh, that channel, um, they've done some work in. Uh, when they first began to uh, develop out there, uh, they actually built a, an earthen dam across the channel. Uh, we contacted the, the city and, and, uh, or the town I'm used to cities, sorry. I've, I've been here a year and a half, I'm working on it. Um, we contacted the town and uh, Public Works made them open it up so that, so that it would drain. Um, but they needed access for their trucks, so they still had trucks coming across that uh, during the time, but, and it would sort of drain. It was better than having the dam across it. Uh, actually building a dam across it um, seems to be in violation of, of uh, your flood control ordinances. I did download your ordinances and started reading through them. So it tells you the other part, how important this is to us. Uh, if you ever sit down and read the ordinances, they're interesting. Um, but anyway, uh, as they developed, uh, they also built a dam for uh, a retention basin uh, or a detention basin up, up towards Antelope Meadows from us. Well, the dam, from what I can gather in talking to people, wasn't built to the plan that was given to the city. Um, and in fact, now Dorn has gone in and uh, modified the dam, again, without any plans coming to the city that I, I can find. Uh, I did talk to the assistant public works director on Monday, and as of Monday, he had no plans as to what that modification was going to be. He didn't even know that they were building. I have pictures of what the dam looks like now. Uh, they raised, the, raised it another about two feet or so and put in a new drain to it. All of this is to slow the water down as it flows from uh, really viewpoint across uh, uh, Pronghorn Ranch and then out into Coyote Springs. As you go through this, you come to the dam where now they have the, uh, they've done some modification to it. But then you have a swale, so the land actually goes down into a little trough. 
And, and then there's a concrete pad that they, they poured across the high pressure gas line that runs out there. Um, and my understanding from talking to uh, one of the surveyors was that there's only a drop of one foot from the, the original dam to the top of the um, uh, concrete pad. And I'm gonna run out of time, I'm sorry. Can I have a few more minutes? Okay. Um, and then there's only a one foot drop, but there's also that swale in between. So the storm that we had yesterday, there's already water standing in that swale. Um, then you come down, as you come down uh, the channel, you come to North Sable Way. And they put in, uh, after they took out their little earthen dam, they put in six pipes. And these six pipes they put uh, about three and a half feet out, they put uh, 15 inch rock. After they dug it down about 18 to 24 inches, they set the rock in there. And that was to slow the water further so that as it, the, the ground would have time to absorb it and it all wouldn't dump into Coyote Springs all at once. Uh, they did that on both sides of the pipe. But on the, on the eastern side of the pipe, they didn't open it up so that it would drain out to the channel into the basin that's there. Now, all the, all the homes on the east side of North Sable Way also have a channel behind them. And that drains water out of Pronghorn down into this basin that eventually goes out into Coyote Springs. Well, since they didn't open it up, <clears throat> and we told them at the time, I did work in flood control for a little part of my career, uh, we told them it wasn't gonna work because there's no place for the water to go. They didn't open it up. And the engineer looked at me and said, you're an accountant, you don't know anything, basically. Um, without saying those words, that's what he's implying. But today, this is what the the pipes look like. The, the ones over here are half full of debris and silt. All the riprap that they put in front and all the riprap that they put on, on the backside of the pipes is gone. So they're gonna have to rebuild this whole, they won't have to take the pipes out, but they'll have to rebuild all the, the riprap and everything that they put in there. But <clears throat> they also put a, a concrete apron and you can just barely see a little bit of it here in this picture. Uh, because it's under silt now. So this whole system failed. And they hired uh, a consultant from Prescott to um, sort of guide them through this because it's really questionable whether or not they've ever done true land development. They build houses, but they don't put in utilities. So he was assigned to talk to us on April 16th. I got an email from him saying that I'm now the point person. And just a week ago, I got an email from him saying that I'm, I'm not going to answer any more of your emails. Uh, if you want to talk to anybody, talk to the town. So here I am. <laughs> because I talked to the staff, and like I said, the staff's been great. But what the staff, you know, dealing with, with, uh, dealing with Dorn has been a pain because there's a, also a noise ordinance about when they can start construction. So when they started digging out the, the channel to put in the pipes, they started like at 6.30 in the morning one day. I contacted them, they said, I'm sorry, it'll never happen again. When they started building their first house, they started about 6.30 one morning. I called them, they said, I'm sorry, it'll never happen again. Now they're putting sewer lines in uh, in the new section that they're going to be developing. And they started about 6.15 in the morning. And this time we contacted them and I sent an email to uh, uh, Boyd, the assistant public works director. And of course, Doran came back and said, I'm sorry, it'll never happen again. Somewhere along here, we missed the point about never happening again. So what we would really like to hear from the town is that you have her back. Because these guys, they don't care about the law. They're building things without, without permits. They're building things without plans that the town has seen. And so, and they don't care about us, you know? So I'm coming to you because you do represent me and you're the ones that are supposed to take care of the citizens. At the end of the day, it falls on you. And so we ask you to put the hammer down on Dorn. 
If they want to build their houses, that's fine. We have no problem with that. What we have a problem with is the drainage. I asked for a hydrological study, a drainage study. Apparently, there's never been one done out there, except maybe 15 years ago when Pronghorn Ranch first started to develop. Well, now there's 2,000 and some odd homes, and Dorn just added 300 and some more that he's building, and then they add, came back to the town and got 55 more put into this. So that has to change the drainage somehow. When you put that much impervious area on top of the land, the water's got to go somewhere, and it's going to find the easiest way to go there. At the end of this drainage system that's still within the, the town, there's uh, a huge concrete block, for lack of a better term, that has two or three pipes in it. They point directly at a house in Coyote Springs. And so this guy who lives there, every time there's a large storm, he gets gushes of water coming at his house. There's a house further north, uh, and the lady who lives there told me that she can't, she can't even send her horses into the lower pasture anymore because all the sweet grass is gone because now it's all flooded out and it's all weeds, and it's all coming off this project here. And this is, unfortunately, Doran bought the property, uh, I guess, knowing that there's drainage issues, and they're going to have to fix them. Well, they're not. They're exasperating the people who live out there, and they don't seem to care about your ordinances. So I was really glad to hear you say, Vice Mayor, that we are all about the law. Good. So we ask you to put the hammer down on them, stop the development until they can get the drainage fixed. We just can't deal with it anymore. I think uh, our town manager has a comment. Yes, we're abundantly aware of your concern, and we do have your back. And you have been in contact with the Public Works Department about every week for uh, quite a while. And, 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 I, and I've gotten reports from the Public Works Director and from his assistant, and they continue to work with Dorn Homes. They do have a master drainage plan. They do have plans that, that perhaps were not, as, were not executed as well as they should have been. And so there are modifications that are going to be made, and they continue to do that. The very important thing is no home has been threatened with storm water uh, based on, on the events that we've had. We've yeah. had some water backing up. We've got silted up structures. Those are all going to be taken care of by the developer. And so uh, we ask that you be patient as they continue to build out to the north. We are abundantly aware of the 100-year floodplain that the properties that you referenced outside of Pronghorn, they are sitting in a 100-year floodplain. They have always had problems. There is now some concentration, which is why there are detention basins being built. And so they continue to work on that. So with that in mind, uh, we would ask that you be patient. We are not getting uh, as quick a response from the developer as we would like, and we continue to work with them. Now, I understand that you want us to be patient, and we have. And we've, we've talked to the town probably every other week, not every week. So... Uh, because I, have, I keep a record of all my emails and everything else. I know when I did it. Um, but what about the issue that there's no plans for whatever the modifications were? What about the issue that there's no permit for the modification? There, According to your there ordinance, will be stamped plans and a, a registered engineer will be on the hook for those. Good. The work in progress. But my understanding was that the town hadn't seen the plan. I mean, if the town hasn't seen the plan, I'm sorry. I, I, I understand what you're saying, that an engineer did it, and I'm not even arguing with the engineer. They know far more about it than I do. Okay. I uh, think we'll have to uh, allow another lady to make some okay. comments here, too. Thank you so much for your comments. <laughs> Greetings. Good to Hi. see you. Yeah, hey, my name is Pamela Carver. I'm the lady he's talking about over there. Um, we are situated, what they say, we are in the 100-year floodplain. Um, we weren't until 2005 when Pronghorn came in. 
Um, I'm on the second property north of in Coyote Springs where those pipes, those god-awful pipes, are facing our property. Um, we've been there for 26 years. Prior to Pronghorn, never did we flood. And there were three major floods in September of 96 that closed Coyote Springs Road three places in the first mile. That water is, shows that it comes from a floodplain that goes to us. It never even made it halfway to where I'm at because it soaks in. Now there is no place to soak in. Um, basically, uh, our 100-year floodplain, and if you look at it through the county, reflects exactly where the flooding was in 2005 thanks to Pronghorn. There were actually houses in Coyote Springs that were islands that were never flooded. Because, And from my latest trip out there, I actually looked at the drainage. Everything, everything from Pronghorn Ranch travels a mile and three quarters to my house. Never has it done that. And I've, we've been out there a long time. And I know my neighbor to the south, he actually had a survey done and was given the paperwork, the elevation survey. He was not in floodplain until Pronghorn came in. Now, since Pronghorn has come in, 2005 we had the 100-year flood, which mimics exactly what FEMA shows. 2009 we had another one. 2014 we had another one. 2017, this year we've had four, I would say 50-year floods. All that water from those pipes that comes off a of pronghorn that shoots at our house, and they are ugly, comes right to us and goes north. Doesn't go to their property, it's on ours. Now my bottom, I'm on 10 acres. The bottom five properties is a recovery site for burrowing owls. They almost got flooded out in 2005 and they were nowhere near flood. And they're, they're returning every year. This is actual federal protected land right there. Um, the last time I mentioned anything to you people, I was concerned about the contaminated water. It's got to be contaminated. I don't have what I had on my bottom property prior to their coming in there. I've got things growing there I've never seen. My horses won't even go near it. Um, my well is between 450 feet and 530 feet. The last time I w it was mentioned by somebody on the, the council that that uh, that should be enough to purify it. It is not. I'm tempted to do a ground dirt survey and I'm tempted to do a water survey because according to Western Technology, who does these tests in Flagstaff, it takes 1,500 feet to purify this water. I don't have a well at 1,500 feet. That's the city well. It's not gonna be purified. Uh, my neighbor to the south, his well, wife will not drink the water out there. So far, we're still alive, so we're, dr we're drinking it. But um, Dorn said that they were going to keep track. I went to every meeting they contacted me by, and nothing. Several months, I've heard nothing from them. Nothing's been done. When that detention basin was put in, we had no, Brown put it in. That was the builder at the time. Um, I saw the plans for it. They've disappeared. County doesn't have them. Anybody else doesn't have them. There was supposed to be a berm in front of that. Those four huge, they're this high. In 2005, the water was coming out three feet high on each one. It was gushing out that bad. Um, there was supposed to be a berm in front of that. So it's magically disappeared. It no longer exists on any plans. Um, the property value, I don't even wanna know what's gonna be because right now, the city owns the land and everything to the north and the weeds are this high. Against my property, my property, if I could have just a, a minute more, my property sits right up to them, right on the property line. When they put the high power sewer line in, it's just a few feet from me. Then they put a, a um, uh, chip seal road there to get to the relay station or whatever that thing is to the north of us. Uh, there are three manholes on the base of my property, on your land. Uh, they're airborne. There's no dirt around them. They are not sealed. Anything that floods goes over the top of them, and anything that's in it could come back up. They are not sealed. 
Dorn, uh, the original plans, they haven't kept me in the loop, so I don't know what they're doing now. They had, right where our property is, they had 300 feet, according to FEMA, of floodplain. I have 300 feet. So far, so good as far as that goes. Dorn wants to move their properties in the houses and only give 90 feet for easement for flood control. In that 90 feet is the chip seal road and the manholes. And they want to raise up their property by three feet and put the houses up. I don't know where that water's going to go. Antelope Meadows is going to be inundated. My house is high enough, I don't worry about it. It's going to be ugly because there is, there's so much water coming from places it never came from before, and it can't soak in. Now we have water coming off of houses. You've got herbicides, pesticides, whatever else they've got, oil. It's not good. If they're going to build houses, they should be able to contain that water on their land, not ours. And I'm just hoping somebody keeps up with it because we didn't have this problem prior to Pronghorn coming in here. Um, we could watch, the only time we had problem with, at the base of our property, and it was a little bit, was because Antelope Meadows had a stock tank there and they knocked that out. Before that stock tank was taken out in the 90s, the water would back up a little bit and sink right in, and an hour it's gone. It's not gone, it takes hours now for our water to go down, and it's just a mess, and those weeds are horrible. So I just, I'm just uh, throwing this out there for your information because what we have now is not what we've had before. People can build, I understand that, but don't dump everything onto us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Pamela. Hi, I'm Karen Hunt. I live in Prescott Valley. One thing, I had a situation in 1995, and someone on this council knows it. According to the zoning code law of Prescott Valley, a developer cannot impede the land where the flow of water can impede onto another property because that's a violation of the town code because I, ha I still have the code of this day. Number two, um, you, with the walking path, and I've mentioned this to the planning and, you know, Norm Davis. A lot of people got brains in their butt. And when they have this walking path and they see this tiny little sign, when you cross manly or spouse or loose, they think the cars that drive down manly, spouse, and loose think we have to stop for them when they go ride their bikes across the walking path. And I would like to have, instead of having a tiny little sign, make it a little bit larger yield sign where people could say yield because it's just like if you come from a side street and it says yield, that means you must yield to the right of way. But the people who sit on their brains think we cars have to yield to them and they don't stop. They just zoom on and I'm afraid somebody's going to get killed if it's not more noticeable, okay? Number two, okay, number two. Um, as you guys know, our tough love child is, is, a, uh, is a chief in the Navy now, and he was on probation for a year. And I was made a couple of suggestions to a couple of council members, maybe having people, the kids who are on probation, come and do community work by cleaning up this, the community center where a lot of trash is. And that is not at the expense of the town of Prescott Valley because when the, people, when the kids have to pay their probation fees, that's what the probation fees go for. Thank you, Karen. But I would like to have a little larger yield sign so that way they don't think yield means for us. So that okay. way it's safe from somebody getting killed. Appreciate that. Anyone else got any comments? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir, I should say. Yes, uh, my name's Ray Grisolano. I live uh, in Pronghorn Ranch on Sable Way. I back up to one of those drainage ditches. And um, I worked for the city of Flagstaff for 25 years in the street department, and a lot of the drainage crud fell on me to get it fixed. So I just want to say I hope you press Dorn Homes Make sure they get all the right permits, do all the right studies, 
and make them fix it. Because if you don't, when they leave, it's going to be on you. It's going to be on this town. And I don't want to see our taxes raised and uh, the city have to go fix the big mess that they left because I've ran into that in the city of Flagstaff quite a few times. So I, I just hope you really look into this. Uh, you really make sure they do a good job and don't flood out Coyote Springs and make sure this all works perfectly. Thank you. Good. We can Thank take you. advantage of your experience. Uh, anyone else? There's no more comment. We have one more item to take care of that everybody hates. That's adjournment. May I make a motion to adjourn? Okay. I'll second the motion. At the motion and a second, would you set the vote, Diane? I don't have my button, but that's all right. Councilmember Anderson? Yes. Councilmember Rooney? Yes. Don't Thank you. No. That's unanimous. Mayor, to pass. Meeting is adjourned. Yeah. Thank you all for coming. I remember.